Good morning, everybody. How are you? And welcome to uh, Perf Web, whichever number it is. I don't remember. 67? 67. That'll be great. Um, usually I do introductions more formally, but in the studio with me today is going to be Tammy Sparacino. Y'all know her very well from Tammy Sparacino Journal Club. And then, of course, coming to us from Nashville is going to be Matt Warhoover and uh, Joey Lapore from uh, Vanderbilt and going to be doing the Vanderbilt Faculty Forum with uh, Katie, right? Katie. Katie's going to be doing it. Is, is this one going to be on single ventricle physiology? Is that what she's doing, Matt? It is. It is? Great. Because I know last week I said it was some, uh, one thing and then, of course, the lecture was on something completely different because we had gotten all messed up on our mm -hmm. timing. Or last month, I should say. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me get through the housekeeping notes. Want to thank our sponsors, myself, um, social media. Please like, follow, share, subscribe on Facebook, Twitter, um, uh, LinkedIn. Uh, what's the other one? I guess there's all kinds of them. So on social media, make YouTube. sure you do that. YouTube, make sure you give us a thumbs up, follow, share, subscribe, bell icon for notifications. Our websites, perfusioneducation.com uh, and perfweb.us. Y'all know what those are for. Contact us at perfusioneducation.com. You got the call-in number if you want to be live on the air. Check out our latest and greatest MediWeb app with the clinical calculator. Really good for perfusionists. Give you all the information you need to do your case. Uh, ECMO for hemodynamics. Uh, you've got an IV and dose Cal uh, IV drug dose calculator conversions, and there's a smaller version of the ebb of the uh, of the app, which you see there. The IV calculator is just a standalone app. Okay, so I think I've blown through everything. Is there anything else I forgot, guys? That's it. Okay, so in that case, without further ado, we're just gonna, huh? Okay, well, we're having technical issues, so let's go to Tammy and I, and I'll introduce Tammy again. Tammy, welcome. Welcome to the show. Good I know morning. this is a journal club program, so we have the fa faculty forum first from Vanderbilt, mm -hmm. and then we have the journal club. What is the journal club about today? Today, the journal club is about, um, really, it's about an interesting technique for delivering cardioplegia. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, I, I read it, and I was really, I got mind-boggled watching, uh, trying to figure out the circuit. I was really having a hard time with it, but hopefully you're going to make that simplified for me. So uh, are we done with the technical difficulties? No, we're trying to get it up. Okay, so we're still working on technical difficulties. How's things going with COVID here in Houston? We're pretty busy, wouldn't you say? I think so, yes. Yeah, we're on the merry-go-round, ECMO mm -hmm. merry-go-round. The ECMO merry-go-round, yes. Is let me ask you this, because we are using an awful lot of ECMO. And as soon as you guys are ready, all you got to do is just yell at me, okay? Um, 30 seconds more. Sounds good. Um, how, are, how are our ECMO outcomes, do you think, thus far, like up to today? Are we seeing any? I know it was really bad for a while. Mm -hmm. It was good and then bad, really bad. Do you see it getting any better? I don't think we see it getting any better for us anyway, but we have had some successes. Um, it's just hard to really appreciate uh, the numbers when we're doing just such a great amount of ECMO. Um, so many of them are not recovering, but we are seeing some successes. You know, sometimes I think the public, and this is something that I've heard, I've actually gotten telephone calls from patients' families in different hospitals wanting to get transferred because they see our program here mm. and they, they think I can get them transferred to a different facility. But uh, I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding or, 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 or misinterpretation of information in a vacuum vis-a-vis. -vis. And what I mean by that is 
you have a really successful story. Patient yeah. survived despite all odds. ECMO was was influential and in part of that equation. Mm -hmm. And that's all the public sees. And then everyone thinks that ECMO is going to save their family member. Um, well, how do you align that? The, the problem is they're only seeing that. You know, we m very recently had a recovery story, a wonderful story about one of our patients that was uh, featured on national news. ABC. A yeah, ABC. And um, it's great. It's a wonderful story. But they're not seeing that, unfortunately, that particular patient was less than 10% of all the patients that we've done to live. Mm -hmm. You know, so they're not seeing all the other things and so although um, it's a miraculous story of, um, of great success they don't understand that that's the outlier that we yeah. have so many that are not doing well that are not um, recovering and you know just like you said about people calling you wanting to, to get their family member transferred for ECMO I've been sitting bedside and had family members who um, heard of ECMO. They knew somebody who was a doctor or something, and they're also requesting it for their family member right there, trying mm -hmm. to just you know order up service, mm -hmm. um, not understanding that their particular family member, unfortunately, wasn't a candidate. Mm -hmm. uh, even in the very wide range of um, parameters that we're um, Expanded parameters, right, I'll call it. Expanded parameters. Significantly expanded. Right, of the people that we are being put on ECMO uh, during this crisis. Um, there are still even some that are being turned down. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Yeah, but Absolutely. I think you're right. They're only seeing a little piece of the whole puzzle. Yeah, it's very, it's, uh, it's, and it's very, you know, ECMO itself is not without its um, potential uh, risks. Right. So are you going to do anticoagulation, not do anticoagulation? Each one of those carries a risk. Your risk of higher risk of infection, mm -hmm. um, you know, secondary type infections mm -hmm. that you can get with all of the cannulas and tubes. Um, and, and, mm. and what about, you know, looking at uh, just really, I don't think we know what is the, the, the um, best pathway. Are you um, intubating immediately? Are you not intubating and going straight to ECMO? Are you weaning the, if you are intubated, are you going to a uh, trach collar? Um, if you're not doing that, uh, which one are you weaning first? Mm -hmm. You know, all of those different things that um, really have, although I think the techniques have been used in the past, people are trying these techniques in various ways trying to really get some success from these patients because mm -hmm. we're seeing so so many deaths so mm -hmm. many unsuccessful ECMO runs mm -hmm. yeah and there's a lot of people that think that lung transplant is a relatively straightforward easy solution to this can you share with the audience perhaps your thoughts on lung transplants from from uh, from organ availability to the very strict criteria for being eligible for transplant yeah. to the recovery period and then the long-term survival of that. Well, I'm, I'm in no way an expert. I, I do not participate in lung transplants at any of our facilities. However, of course, it's an area of interest for us just being, uh, you know, what we do and uh, especially within this last COVID crisis that we're going through, um, I think lungs are one of the least available um, organs for transplant, so therefore they have very strict criteria. Mm -hmm. You know, single uh, organ failure. Um, BMI under 30. Yeah, be a, very, uh, uh, a very much more restricted BMI requirement. And even after a very successful lung transplant, the um, long-term, uh, the life expectancy after that is really not as long as you would think. Uh, isn't it somewhere between uh, like five and, se uh, five and 10 years? Yep, somewhere around there. Yeah. And your life is also very much consumed with taking medications, anti-rejection drugs, follow-ups mm -hmm. with visits. Now you do have some decent quality of life. Mm -hmm. You know, Doug Seal, who's a perfusionist, 
Um, you know Doug. No, I actually you know, don't. He's uh, with DSA Perfusion, Doug Seal and Associates in, okay. uh, in Louisiana, New Orleans more oh. specifically. But he goes around that regional area and stuff. And him and I have been very good friends for a very long time. And uh, he's a wonderful person, runs a business like I do. He mm -hmm. goes, he's like the Louisiana version of ATT, I mm -hmm. guess, so to speak. But he had double lung transplant here at Methodist. Oh, really? He sure did. Wow. He did. And he went back to work. So he does have a meaningful life. Yes. You know, albeit there are challenges. Sure. But he has, he is happy. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing that I would like to address, if I can, is ECMO and it's, it's, um, it's a support explaining maybe better to the audience who may be listening that ECMO is not going to cure your problem, your disease. Right. I think that is a, um, unless you are really familiar and within this whole, um, oh, we're ready? Oh, well, we can go oh, we back can, to this. We can finish this thought. Go ahead. Finish okay. your thought. Well, I think that is a, a, a very large misconception that ECMO is going to um, fix anything with right. the patient. It's just a means to allow the patient to heal. Right. And if or for the medication to work. Correct. Right. It's a Whatever support. that pathway may be. Right. But it's a support. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. It's not a, it's not a, it's not really a treatment. Correct. It's a, it's an ability to oxygenate, ventilate the patient so that their normal physiology can be maintained, albeit the physiology is not really normal, uh, maintain normal by ECMO because it is an artificial means mm -hmm. and you do interact with the circuit and of course if the lungs are starting to sclerose and they're so grossly inflamed you start to worrying about the right ventricle then you have to consider other cannulation or medications vis-a-vis -vis milrinone or whatever they use nowadays. Well. You know, uh, um, lots it, of factors. If you think about it, I mean, thinking that ECMO is going to uh, be the cure for whatever is wrong with someone's lungs is the same way of thinking if you were going to go in for heart surgery and you just put someone on the pump and the surgeon did nothing. Right. Yes. Yes. Right. I've worked with some surgeons where that would have been a better option. Okay. So, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> you like got a chuckle. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you have two, I'll bet. I'll bet you have two in your career. No comment. No comment, exactly. He's so politically correct. He's the opposite of Joe Bosch. Well, that's because he's a he's at a big institution. I'm at a <laughs> private company. We we have that. I'm I'm more. I'm you have more, latitude. I'm a little more Trumpian, <laughs> and he's a little more. You're a little more. Um, Don't. He, well, he, no, I'm not going to say anything bad. I wouldn't <laughs> pick somebody bad. Okay. Like, like Come someone on. else. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, we'll pick somebody good. You're a little more. He's a little more Pence, Pence, Pensky. He's Penskyan. Okay. You're more like, like, like Mike Pence. You're just okay. more politically savvy. Yeah. Trump was just apolitically unsavvy. Hmm. Yeah, well, and I think that's. We're really going down a rabbit hole here. Yeah, or you're the Omar Bradley, and I'm the Patton. Okay. That'll work. Okay. Yeah. Or he's the, the, the Eisenhower, and I'm more the Truman. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think that, or no, Roosevelt, not Truman, the first Roosevelt. Um, okay. So, are we ready? Matt Warhoover? Is Katie yes, here? Sir. Or what can you tell me about what's going on at Vanderbilt through the COVID? We just opined about our situation here, and I am curious to know how not only your case volume numbers, but also how your outcomes look in terms of, not necessarily, we could talk about the transplant, but, and I read something recently that I need to get your opinion on, but how, what I'd really like to know is, what are your bridges to recovery looking like compared to your bridges to transplant? And you're talking about for the COVID population, correct, Joe? Yes, sir. I'm, that's that's it. Now you can talk about other things too, but my, my specific yeah. question had to do with COVID because that's what we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. I think we're uh, I think we're having a 65 to 70 percent survival on all patients, um, and I think we've only transplanted probably three. Um, so uh, I think we're close to. Uh, 60, 
60 patients in a cohort, 70 patients in a cohort, uh, our COVID population uh, on ECMO. Are you pretty restrictive in terms of your inclusion criteria for COVID patients going on ECMO? Because we are not. Yes, we are very uh, restrictive at, at you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not on the committee, uh, and I'm not even privy to the committee meetings, but there is a uh, daily, there's a day, once we have an, o an opening in the hospital, uh, we've, we've done a cap uh, on how many uh, outside transfers we're allowed in, um, just by a capacity of not only from uh, bed, bed capacity and uh, human capital, you know, human manpower uh, capacity, but also physical capital. Um, We've mm -hmm. capped it, uh, and, and to be quite frank, they, every time there's an opening that at 12:30 uh, that day, there's a, a selection committee that they run the list of all the phone calls that we've gotten, and they they you know, they select which patient we feel is a need, needs the most help, and B is within the the range of help still. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yes, yes it does. Yes. We don't necessarily take the the, the, the sickest patient. And we don't necessarily take the most recent phone call. What we do is, and we're in constant contact. I say we, uh, the people that are involved in directly, they're in constant contact with the, uh, with the referring centers. physicians, yeah. and facilities. And, and, yeah, and so uh, what what I've heard in the in the, the middle Tennessee area is that um, the this wave is going to peak sometime September seventh, eighth ish. Mm. What they said. Um, I know two weeks ago today is uh, when we actually, I think, hit our, uh, I, I know the data behind that. We, within 10 days, we had 100 and, um, 167 phone calls of people under the age of 40 that were single, um, single organ failure uh, that needed ECMO. Wow. Matt, can I interrupt for just a second? Um, are, are the people that you're seeing now um, needing ECMO, are they the unvaccinated population? 100% uh, are, are the people unvaccinated, yes. Okay. That's mm -hmm. what we're seeing as well. Just, mm -hmm. you know, wondering if you were seeing something different. Um, uh, I think that's been that way for at least the last, how long would you say, a few months? At least. Yeah. And oh, these are all, we have no one on ECMO that's vaccinated. Right, right, right. We don't have anybody in the ICU that's vaccinated. Correct. There um, may be a few people that went to the hospital, a few. But I've got to tell you this story. God, forgive me. You were saying something. I'm sorry. Go no, ahead. No, I was just going to say, and the population has just gotten so much younger. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. They're ridiculously younger. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's frightening. 26-year-olds, um, 30-year-olds, 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds. Um, very young people. That and not we're just seeing. one twenty-something. We've no. had many twenty-something. Yes. 20 yes. So and, I, and I can't speak. I can't speak for the committee, but what, what I understand, my what, what I what I, you know, get secondhand or thirdhand knowledge is that they're looking specifically for people under the age of forty mm -hmm. that are single organ failure, um, that you know have a P to F ratio. You know. Of a certain criteria, mm -hmm. and have not been on the vent, you know, for a certain criteria. So, mm -hmm. and it's not they're cherry picking the, you know, the, the easy fruit. What they're trying to they're trying to delineate who is who is really a viable candidate uh, uh, to pour resources into, well, and and who who really needs the help uh, compared to well, are they just a borderline ECMO patient? We, we're not taking even borderline people. We're be, we're taking people that. You know, ECMO is really their only option before death. But on the same token, they haven't gone too far, um, you know, outside the window to where you know we're trying to snatch. Well, I mean, um, that's exactly what the the ELSO guidelines for once we are in these higher level peaks, you're supposed to be very selective because mm -hmm. of limited resources. You know. So Matt, this is something that is is uh, actually, and I had a very interesting conversation. So yesterday. I walked into a pharmacy, a pharmacy that I go to normally, and said, hey, I had the Pfizer uh, uh, vaccine. Second dose was late December, mm -hmm. um, you know, 64 years old plus, 
Um, am I eligible to get the Pfizer booster, and do you have it available? Oh, absolutely. You're, you're elig everybody's eligible. If you, have the, if you have the Pfizer vaccine or the Moderna vaccine, we have boosters available. So if you want the Pfizer, go ahead and have a seed, and we're going to give it to you. So I went ahead and got it. And then I said, okay, I'm also required, you know, work-wise to get my flu vaccine. Is there any problem with me getting my flu vaccine at the same time? Nope, the CDC says there's no restriction. You can get vaccinated with both things at the same time. So left arm, I got the, um, the uh, Pfizer uh, booster. Right arm, I got the uh, flu vaccine. And then we still have some hospitals that make us do TB. So I got the TB on my right arm. So I just got shot up with everything imaginable. And uh, my left arm is a little sore today compared to, I mean, it's, it was sore like within an hour or two of getting the injection, but I think that had to do, I don't think they needed that big of a needle and they, I don't <laughs> think they had to push it in that hard, but they did, Whap! and it was, it was in. So I think the bruising is from the injection technique more than it is necessary, but it's still kind of sore. Mm -hmm. um, but then I had the pharmacist, um, actually it was the nurse practitioner who did the TB part of it, and uh, she was not vaccinated. She was a young oh. woman, not vaccinated, said, I don't want to take the vaccine. And I was like trying to tell her about our experience. And she says, yeah, that's your experience. But my experience is I see thousands of people who get COVID and just recover from it. You only see the ones that don't. Mm -hmm. And so, and we are so overwhelmed. So is this really, a, is the, is the, is what we're seeing a, re a, a, a limitation of our healthcare system, or is it a really just, a, like how is it becoming overwhelmed? Are we seeing that we're not, that we don't have a robust enough healthcare system because we have been over, we're overburdened, we're overtaxed, hospitals are too full. Yeah. Be right with them, I'll be right with them. Yeah, you know, that's an interesting way to think about it because I've often wondered, is it our perspective uh, that we're only seeing the sickest of the sick? Um, you know, when she obviously would see lots of people who come in uh, being, working in a pharmacy uh, who were ill with COVID and likely get better. But there's no mistaking that we don't have enough rooms and that we actually are housing sick patients um, you know, in hallways in, in a, a major city that has lots of hospitals um, yes. available. So I don't know where the disconnect is there. I've got some other inf interesting data too, but we have a phone caller. We have somebody that's calling in. Go ahead, you're live on the air. Hey guys, this is John Ingram. Can you hear me okay? Hey John, yeah, Hi, we John. can hear you. How are you? Hey, hey Matt, hey Sammy, good to see you guys. Um, well, you're talking about the vaccinated or unvaccinated. We now have vaccinated people that are go, that are first going on. We do have one now, 41-year-old uh, medical professional who got vaccinated, you know, fairly soon when it, when it was available, and um, is on ECMO. That's the first one that we've seen. Oh, wow. And um, and we also have some vaccinated. A number in the hospital, you know, on ventilator and so on. Mm -hmm. And as far as the youth and the young age coming through, it's unbelievable. The 20 year olds now that, that were pretty much uh, getting referred. I think, Matt, you were saying a minute ago when I just started tuning in that you're turning down a whole ton of references that people want to send you potential ECMO patients. We're turning them down sometimes every couple hours mm -hmm. that outside line hospital that don't have ECMO, uh, our, our feeder hospitals are trying to call us. I know in one weekend we turned down 15 referrals a couple weekends ago mm -hmm. that we couldn't take. And mm -hmm. as far as the shortage goes, there's, there's a lot more of a staffing shortage than a room shortage, but the rooms are being taken up too, don't get me wrong, but, but the, the, the rubber hits the road a lot harder when you start talking about nursing, respiratory, and all the support staff. Mm -hmm. Well, we are. Well, go ahead, Matt. I agree 100 percent, John. Uh, that it really, you know, the, the limiting factor that we have here at Vandy is is the human uh, capital. Uh, we just don't have we don't have the nurses and the support staff to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is it overburdened? So 
why is our health care system, if we have that enough beds, which in some of our institutions we don't. Yeah. We are, we are, in fact, even, even you, Vanderbilt, I know you built uh, an entire garage out into a COVID unit. Um, so you have had expansion of the facilities themselves, but us too, we are having, you know, nurses are tripled, sometimes quadrupled, which is really difficult to do for them. Um, and they're being, I mean, really, they don't have a choice but to do it. I mean, they could quit, but that would be, that would be a, a disservice to their to their profession. They can't just quit. Uh, but a lot of them did go to go traveling and things mm -hmm. like that because they could make a lot more money. So you are seeing shifting resources all around. But still, taking care of four very sick patients, even though they're trying to give them, you know, only one or two that are really sick. And then how much attention are those patients getting when they have other patients to take care of? And the other thing that has bothered me a little bit is, and I've asked this question of people, how many non-COVID patients have died from a different disease that was treatable because there was no place to put them in the hospital or get them in the hospital because it was overrun with COVID patients? In other words, so for how, for how many how many non-COVID patients died from other diseases to save one COVID patient? That's, that's my question. Hmm. You know, coming back real quick to something that you said about nurses, uh, you know, and other support staff as well being, um, you know, tripled and, and sometimes quadrupled and, you know, how much care are they giving? I, I think that as... Uh, and this is critical care, ICU, yes. three and four. I'm not talking about the floor right. where it's one to 20. Right, because we're talking about we're the not there anyway. Critical we would, care unit. We wouldn't even be witnessing that, but we're witnessing right. this in all of our hospitals, really. Um, and I think that it's falling to us. We're having to do a lot more caregiving to these patients to help assist these nurses. Absolutely, absolutely, and we are. We have. I tell you what, I've said this a billion times. My job compared to nursing is easy. Mm -hmm. They have a hard job. I have so much respect for the nursing community, especially in, in particular, of course, what I'm exposed mostly to, the critical care nursing and the, uh, the operating room in this, uh, through this disaster. I've, it has really, really raised them up in my, uh, in my hierarchy of, of, you know, being uh, incredible people, incredible, incredibly dedicated professionals. And so invested in their in their patients, I'm I'm proud. I am proud to work around these people. Mm -hmm. I'm humbled by it. Um, a real quick question for Matt and John: Are you seeing any limitations with your um, ECMO uh, devices? Your your you know have a certain mm -hmm. amount of machines, and and that's the amount of patients you can have. Are you maxing out in in that capacity? Well, I, I, well I can, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll address that first, if you don't mind. We, um, we must have the luxury of being a top priority for McKay because we're able to actually buy um, a few more cardio help. And, but we have gone ahead and bought three of just about everything. We have three breeds. So we, have, uh, we have four sparks. Um, we have, um, you know, we don't have any of the, uh, I think it's what is it, the uh, EMP3 or something by uh, mm -hmm. at Saruma. We don't have those yet. But, um, but we, we, yeah, I mean, we seem to be a priority where we can get equipment when we ask for it. Otherwise, I know a lot of hospitals, they, they ask for equipment and the company just say, we don't, we don't have it. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. And uh, you, you'll do without it. So um, I guess just because of our volume, we've been sort of a, as a priority. But, but I have a question for you guys. On the staffing, and I, I always wonder, almost wonder, like, where is all the staff? Like, I've heard that people have dropped out of health care, and I don't know of anybody. What is that? Hand, he, he knows people that, have dropped out of health care. Do, do you think that's true? Because I, I was wondering if that's really true. Well, well, let's do this. Hey, so well, let's. Real so quick, I, wanna, I just want to hear Matt's response to mine, and then I want to come back to that's John's. Right, yes. Yes. Matt, so, what, are you limited by your ECMO machines? Well, I, I can say we were. Um, we were, you know, 
nothing moves very quickly, uh, you know, in any large institution. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, I'm not going to say it wasn't in the works already, but it definitely expedited it. Mm -hmm. We were uh, fortunate enough to, we, we purchased uh, seven new oh. uh, Spectrum uh, pumps mm -hmm. on Monday of, uh, of last week. Wow. Oh, wow. Well, it, it, you know, it was an ongoing, it's been ongoing for sure. months, but we, they actually landed and uh, got them through Biomed on Sunday night, got them in on Friday uh, late, Biomed on uh, Sunday night, and on Monday of the seven, uh, we had, we used two of them that day. Wow. And, wow. That, you know, we're up to four. And so you increase capacity in your capital equipment. But you're still, you know, our limiting factor is is the support staff and the nursing right. staff. Mm -hmm. uh, and to, you know, to segue into what John was talking about, we have seen we have seen uh, transition out of traditional healthcare roles into, you know, maybe you know a, a consultant or a industry, mm -hmm. some you know other peripheral roles that, you know, the, the circles you know overlap in some places, but your primary healthcare, you know, your primary healthcare uh, provider. Now you're somewhere in the support staff of, of whether it be industry, sales, um, you know, any of that. We've seen we've seen a, a vast amount of nurses just frankly get burnt out yeah. and, and move out, and you know that oh, I, I see it I see it daily the burnout that they have. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it, it's unfortunate, and you know we've got some patients that you know whether had ICU delirium or just a little bit you know combative, whatever the reason is, is and you have to understand they're in the COVID positive room, so they're gown glove, you know, all that all day long on these ECMO patients just to keep them from pulling their cannulas out. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. Imagine twelve hour shifts in those you know in those suits. It just, it, it's really, it's really mentally uh, and physically, you know, exhausting on these people. And so, you know, we have been, uh, as, as perfusionists, running at a, at a 30,000 foot view, you know, monitoring everybody across the board. We have gotten more involved in direct patient care, even if it's just staying in a room for 15 or 20 minutes, right. really monitoring the patient so they don't pull a cannula out. Mm -hmm. So the nurse can get out of there, walk away, get a cup of coffee, get something yeah. to drink. Kind of, you know, you know, decompress. Use the bathroom. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, something. You know. Basic function. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. I mean, I mean, I agree with you. Burnout is 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 huge. I'm getting burned out, and you know, I, you know, this is I'm in the twilight of my career, and I've said this to several people. I'm not about to abandon ship while it's sinking. And I'm not about to leave the battlefield in the middle of the battle. Yes, I but hope we're not sinking. Maybe we're just taking on a little water. A, a little. <laughs> um, but I. Um, but when this is over, and we have, you know, gotten through this, and we're sort of back to what is considered normal, without these surges and and so forth. Um, I don't know that I want to stay. I don't. I don't know that I can keep doing this. This is really. This has affected me, mm -hmm. and uh, you know I don't know that I want to stay in health uh, clinical, clinical medicine right. um, after we get through this. But I would never, at this point in time, you know, it's just not in me. But I could respect people who just through sheer, I mean, I think they have PTSD. I think that they have been so traumatized and affected by this. That when they, they just they just say I can't do this anymore I've got to quit and they quit and that is horrible for us because you lose one trained qualified capable healthcare professional in your institution at this moment the impact is tremendous it's not just okay well you know Jimmy Jimmy John decided to go take a job someplace else you know no worries okay good luck bye. And then they're just easily replaced, and uh, yeah. everything just runs along just fine. It's profound when somebody decides to leave a unit of any sort in this moment that we're in, because we're at such capacity, mm -hmm. or exceed we're exceeding capacity. We really are. And I also comment 
you know, I, I think a lot of it, uh, the burnout also has to do with, I think there's some underlying frustration because there's there's a lot of, you know, what, what you pointed out, Joe, is that there's people in different stages of their career. But, you know, you've got people in their late 20s, early 30s that typically, you know, would be taking care of people, you know, in their, you know, late 40s sometimes, 50s, you know, sometimes, but more, more closely, you know, they're taking care of people in their 60s and 70s most of the time sure. in these ice cubes. Um, yeah. That's yeah. what they're used to taking care of. And then you flip the script on them, and, and they're taking care of people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, and they're constantly, uh, you know, in such a bad, uh, acute state of health. And it's just, I think it's demoralizing that, you know, they go, this is not what I signed up for watching young people die. In addition, the, the, the length of care that is going on with these, um, mm -hmm. you know, just, you know, we, we had one, one patient on 128 days on ECMO. Mm -hmm. We've had another one 119 days on an ECMO. The, the, the continuum of care that goes across, we're talking months uh, of, of direct care, mm -hmm. and that, that, that just wears on people. Although, you know, it, it's nice to know the patient and you get to know the family, it's just, I think it's, I think it's morally, and especially when they leave, and you go, what did we just do? And, and it, you get to reflect on it and go, you know, Mrs. So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so, then we, we got him out of the hospital, and what they think about it, they go, we just got him out of our hospital. That, you know, it's a long-term, you know, rehab, right. long-term vent floor. That, that's just, they just made it over one obstacle. Mm -hmm. And then after the time to reflect on it, really, uh, when people walk away, they go, you know, get out of there, they go, what are we really doing? And I think that's the that's what really drives people out of the industry. Well, and I think, too, um, especially for younger professionals coming into this, I mean, we have some new perfusionists that are recently graduated and joined us. And, you know, this isn't probably what they thought they were going to be getting into, you know, for such a long period of time. This isn't just a... A, a, a little bump in the road. I mean, we're, we're, we're climbing a mountain right now um, trying to just get over the top, and I'm sure it's the same in other professions. So what's that going to do to the longevity of someone's career? Is this going to give them burnout early? Are they going to change their mind about what it is that they are wanting to do because of this? Mm -hmm. you know? No, I totally understand. So we have a question from uh, YouTube from Jack, uh, Jacqueline Lamb. Um, and it says, if you don't mind sharing, what is your ECMO capacity? Now, John uh, answered, he is at 25, So, but they have a COVID unit in one hospital or an ECMO. And I think they have two different units or three different units where they can house these patients, but it's in one facility. Matt, I know you're coming from a single facility. Uh, but you may have also different units where you have these ECMO patients. I'm not sure if this question is, and I'm assuming it is. It's COVID ECMO capacity is actually the question. So do you have a, John says 25. What is Vanderbilt doing in terms of your capacity, and how would you adjust that if you needed to? Well, um, so we, we do ECMO on three different units. Uh, four different units now because we've made a, a, a complete COVID unit. Uh, current capacity, uh, as far as from machines, we have we could do we could do 22 machines in one facility, uh, but it, with the appropriate backups. Mm -hmm. um, that's our max. Um, we have put it, uh, and that's that's all all ECMO. That's lung transplant, heart transplant, post cardiomy. But from a COVID standpoint. What we have done is we have put a limit on outside transfers uh, to six, knowing that our internal volume of COVID patients, patients that come in through our own ER or uh, you know, patients that are uh, already in the hospital here that may, you know, you know I want to say it's not progress because progress would be, you know, regress into needing um, ECMO uh, from a health standpoint. We, you know, we want to make sure that we, we're taking care of, um, you know, the, the, the hub that we are. And so, you know, our outside transfers from east and west Tennessee, from, uh, you know, from 
southern and western Kentucky, southern Illinois, uh, northern Alabama, northern Mississippi, Georgia, those areas, we also want to support them, but we have to make sure that we're taking care of our, our, our demographic here locally as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a, a follow-up question to that. Do you reserve anything for um, non-COVID patients? Like, are, are you saving any ECMO machines to use in other ways? Or are you just whatever patient presents that needs ECMO, um, as long as it's within your capacity, it, uh, you just go ahead and, and utilize? With, with the with the injection of these new uh, uh, spectrum pumps, what we've what we've now done is we've got uh, six uh, uh, central mag machines, mm -hmm. which of course you know require the you, you know they don't have a backup to hand crank. You have yeah. to you know have specific back, uh, backup. Backup machine. We have machine. six yeah. central mag heads um, that are dedicated strictly to our uh, thoracic okay. and cardiac patients. Yeah. And so. Now that we've got this injection, we are no longer going to get it. Those are going to put on, be put on reserve for only our um, our solid organ transplant yeah. mm -hmm. uh, yeah. patients. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we have put a buffer in for those. And I, I, I would assume that those the post cardiotomy patients from our cardiac surgery volume, that you know those would fall in line for that. So you know, that being said, we have probably 16 uh, a capacity of 16 or uh, to to go for COVID yeah. more mm -hmm. specifically. Okay. 16 mm -hmm. for COVID. That, that's what I was wondering because mm -hmm. we, we initially were doing something like that. You know, we were saving a machine for non-COVID, but that doesn't seem to be happening mm -hmm. anymore. Well, it's what I think is very interesting and I'm, I'm very proud of actually in our practice and we practice in multiple hospitals. Um, community hospitals, but some they busy are ones. Right, they are community-based hospitals, and we we have nine. We are managing nine patients currently in three different institutions, which is very challenging for us as an organization. We are actually stretched to beyond our limit, and again, you just can't. We just recently hired even more people. We do have some people that are leaving. Um, some people that are going into retirement, they've had enough of this and they're just going to retire. Um, and I can't blame them. I mean, they, they have every right in the world to do that uh, at this stage of their career. But we are in a, a disaster. From a technology perspective, it, I don't think that's our limitation. I think technology is, is, is the, like Matt said earlier, it's really the personal, the personnel, the professional level resources to run these things safely and be able to manage them. But we've also experienced, I don't know if anybody else is having this, um, some concerns about oxygenators because there's only one manufacturer mm -hmm. of the polymethylpentene technology, the plasma type membrane like the EOS or the Quadrox or the uh, 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 MC3, the yeah. Nautilus and things like that. So if that becomes an issue, and the other thing I think, we in community-based settings there's, tr there's, I, and I don't think the public understands this, that ECMO is not ubiquitous. Not every, there's probably fewer hospitals providing ECMO, and I think this has got to be a huge difference, far fewer that provide ECMO, even if they do heart surgery, than do not provide it. So most community hospitals that are doing heart surgery don't really offer ECMO as an option. And, you know, and then you have some companies who are trying to take advantage of this issue going on, and they're going out and just selling them these, these devices. Oh, you could use this, and just the nurse at the bedside can run it. You just have to put it in. You don't even need a perfusionist to take care of this machine. And I am a big believer in the blended program, ECMO specialist. Um, and perfusionist blended program running these things. In fact, you have to have a full team. But when you put somebody on ECMO, it isn't just all, it's, it, that's, where the, that's where the complications start to happen. It's not, it gets better, yes, the oxygenation and the CO2 removal, the ventilation and the oxygenation, but the problems associated with ECMO. The ECMO baggage? Yes, a lot of it. And if you don't know how to manage that, 
anticoagulation, what type of anticoagulation, no anticoagulation. Well, it's not even uh, from um, the... Bleeding the, complications, infection. Yeah, it's not just the circuit, it, you know. It's it's the whole... It, so it's not even the nurse who maybe isn't trained, let's say. Right. Um, uh, just kind of gets thrown into it. It's the whole team. If your ICU doesn't manage, you know, ECMO, mm -hmm. your ICU doesn't have any practice managing ECMO. Correct. Right. That's and right. So two of our hospitals in the community are capped at four. So they can, although we have had five in both, even though four is currently all we can do, we've had five at two institutions, because now there's more of it over here and those machines are no longer available. Yeah. And we're not, we're a private practice. You can't just, I can't go out and buy four spectrum pumps. I don't have that kind of money to start with. And even if they did, we don't know how to run it because we don't, this is what we use. Now, we can maybe, uh, we have a patient who we were able to get um, a pump from the medical center uh, that they had in storage because we really needed it for this patient. Because we were already and maxed out at our machines. We were maxed out and we needed another machine and they brought it. And uh, look, it took, a, it took a PhD to turn this machine on. It took me 35 minutes just to get it to run. It's a little bit older. It is <laughs> much, much, much older. But it is a platform that mm -hmm. did work. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, the patient didn't survive. Um, but we're using it on a new patient now. We are using it on a new patient now. That is correct. So those we're are on the, the merry-go-round. Right, we are. And uh, so to answer the 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 question, uh, uh, answer Jacqueline's question. For our area where we practice, I would say nine or ten is about the most we can do. Mm -hmm. John is at twenty-five, and Matt is at. Uh, at what was the number 12, you gave? Twelve at? or fourteen. Twelve to fourteen. Yeah, it's not unlimited. No, right, it's right. not. Right, very good. Okay, and uh, let's oh. see. Do we have Katie here? Yep, we, we, Katie's Katie's here. Okay. Katie's here. Hi, Katie. Welcome, Katie. Matt, will you introduce she, Katie to everybody? Absolutely. Give us about another minute. Oh, She's okay. figured out, and, and, uh, and we're ready for her presentation. I'm sure uh, David's got that all loaded up. Well, okay. this has been a really good conversation, it I is. think. Well, and I'll just to do one follow-up comment since we have a minute. Um, this actually just happened to us uh, in our, our practice. You know, there was one ECMO machine available at one of our facilities because uh, someone had been transferred, and so we had freed up a machine. And, of course, we had a lot of people that were on ECMO watch. But none of them great candidates, but there was one in particular that was declining, and so they were considering using that machine and um, they didn't. They decided to sort of wait it out, see if they could medically manage prone some more, et cetera. And the very next day, we needed that machine for post-cardiotomy. Um, yes, I remember. And we wouldn't have had a machine mm -hmm. if they had chosen a patient that wasn't a good candidate anyway. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. a real lesson there. Yes, I think so too. Yes, there are limitations. Because now that post-cardiotomy patient, of course, had a short ECMO run is off. And, and did well. And did well. But we could have left them on the heart-lung machine, obviously. We could, True. There's a lot of things you can do. It's just very suboptimal because sure. rolling a heart-lung machine into the ICU Which we did. is just a challenge on its that, own. Was that Surge 2? Yes, Surge 2. And, uh, and then, of course, the space it takes up, um, the difficulty getting around it and moving in the well, room. Well, and you know, also what it does to your, um, your cardiac surgery program. Right, exactly. Well, I think, and that's, uh, I'll, I'll finish this off with my fundamental question, and that is how many patients died from delayed care because the hospitals were so overwhelmed, they couldn't get in the hospital, they couldn't get seen, for whatever the reason is, they couldn't get surgery, kept getting put off, whatever the reason is, how many patients or people died for every one COVID patient was saved. And I, if, if that, in, I mean, I think that will be teased out of the data somehow, somewhere, mm -hmm. but I think that's going to be something, and I might, my guess, my suspicion is, it's going to be a higher number. It's not gonna be a one for one, or it's not gonna be 0.5. I think it's going to be several for one. Well, and uh, so, so we've lost several patients 
for each COVID patient that we saved. And I don't know if this sounds unsympathetic, and maybe it sounds a little harsh, but I think at some point in time, if you refuse to be vaccinated um, and you get sick, now if you're vaccinated and you still get it, I think you do everything you can. But if you're unvaccinated and you get it, you had the, tr the, the you made the decision to not be vaccinated. A personal I, decision, a not, personal, a medic not a yes, medical decision. Yes, not for a medical, right, because you thought they were going to track you. Uh, and I will tell you, as soon as I got that shot by arm yesterday, that booster, I was hearing a phone ring. And I'm telling you, it's been ringing ever since. Um, but if you think that these vaccines are dangerous or they're not going to work or whatever the case may be, and you don't want to take it because you don't know what's in it, you don't know what's in the stuff we're doing to you when you get to the hospital. Yeah. And so I think that at some point in time we have to say, if you've decided to not be vaccinated, there's only so much we can do to help you. We'll do, the, we'll do what we can, but, ex but advancing their care to um, full ECMO and the whole thing to try and really, for us, very low survival numbers, I don't think necessarily makes sense. That's my opinion. What do you think? And can you guys sit a little closer? Well, I, I, I don't think we can refuse care, but I think there can be a limitation on how many so it doesn't overrun uh, the hospital systems uh, and health care for all the other patients. I think that that, that It's just not fair to other patients who got vaccinated that have. Now, I understand, you know, if you're obese and you have coronary disease, you smoke and you have coronary disease. I know that's a slippery slope. And I realize that you can take that down a lot of rabbit holes, but there are a lot of patients who have idiopathic aortic stenosis that should have as much opportunity to get their TAVR, but it's canceled, 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 canceled. And then you lose those patients, but you don't know if you've lost them to a bad outcome or they went someplace else. And you really don't know unless, you know, somebody's following that. And so I think that's information that we're going to have to tease out of the, the data well, mine we're, uh, at some point in time. We're all here to take care of patients and to save lives. It's just so frustrating to see um, our capacity not be what it needs to be for the current situation. Yes, but that's a big, bigger, big, huge mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. So Matt, you were going to say something. I'm sorry. Katie, good morning. It's Hi, so Katie. nice to see you again. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, uh, Katie's back, uh, you know, with, with the uh, with us again from last month. Uh, she's one of the pediatric perfusionists over at the, the Monroe Carroll Children's Hospital associated with Vanderbilt. Um, she's been with us for three or four years now and uh, originally uh, did her work at MUSC and we we're very uh, happy to have her on this uh, campus. And uh, unfortunately, Joe, I'm going to have to, because it is a little tight in this window here, my fault. Uh, I, you know, uh, I could tell you I could push myself away from the table a little bit more. But I'm going to let Katie take over. I have to go. We are uh, maxed out at capacity this morning with a, a COVID patient, and I actually have to go go do something here with one of them, take them to IR. No and worries. I'm gonna let, yeah. No I'm worries. Gonna let, Katie, I'm gonna let Katie do her thing, and uh, I, I may or may not be back. But uh, Joe, it's always good to see you. Tammy, thanks for having Great me. To good you. to see you, too, and glad you're looking healthy. I know you went through some of your own issues. <laughs> be safe, and we'll talk to you, Matt. Bye. Katie, all right. Katie, the floor is yours. Okay. All right. So I'm going to talk today about single ventricle physiology. Um, and let's see. Real quick, um, I'm going to do just a little brief review of the, the steps of kind of a traditional single ventricle repair. Um, and then I'm going to tell you what I really want to talk about, which isn't just those traditional steps. So. Next slide, please. All right, so I think we all probably remember at least learning about single ventricle physiology, um, typical hypoplastic left heart patient, um, and the three stages of their repair, which is going to be the Norwood, the Glenn, and the Fontan. So if you don't remember, um, basically these steps are to end up with a goal of having your systemic ventricle um, your right or left, whichever that ventricle is, pump to the body, and then having passive blood flow to the lungs. Um, that's, the, that's the goal of our single ventricle um, staging. And depending on the exact anatomy, these steps might look a little bit different, and the timing might be a little bit different. Next slide, please. 
But what I really want to talk about is not just those steps. I kind of want to talk about who gets a single ventricle repair and why. So we all we all know that the hypophosphatic left heart is our our typical single ventricle, but there are many other complex anatomies that might be a candidate for a single ventricle repair. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk a little bit about the history of single ventricle palliation, some of the techniques, the complications, morbidity and mortality, um, what happens with a quote unquote failing Fontan, and what some future treatments might be. So if you're an adult perfusionist, you might be thinking, why do I care about this? Um, but I think that as more and more of these patients um, survive longer into adulthood, that even you adult perfusionists are going to be seeing these patients. You might be seeing these failing Fontans. You might be seeing transplants for these patients. So I think it's great for everyone to kind of have an understanding of this physiology. Next slide, please. So the first thing I want to talk about is some of the things that go into the decision of who's going to get a single ventricle repair versus a biventricle repair. So these are going to be some of our patients that have complex anatomy, um, but they still might have two ventricles. So what are some of the things to help the surgeons or the cardiologists decide if they should get a single ventricle repair? So we have to think about the long-term outcome of the Fontan procedure overall and the specific suitability of that patient for a Fontan. Um, and then the long-term outcome if they were to undergo that complex biventricular repair. Um, that might involve multiple procedures. They might not really have a great quality of life. They might be in the hospital more than they're out of the hospital. There's medical expenses, et cetera. Um, and so we have to think about that specific patient, whether they are suitable for a biventricular repair or a single ventricle repair. So remember, again, single ventricle isn't just for hypoplastic left heart. Um, and it also isn't necessarily for every hypoplastic left heart. Um, so really, we're, we're going to talk mostly about the single ventricle or the biventricular repair. But the other choice, of course, is heart transplantation. So we'll talk a little bit more about that choice um, later on. Next slide. So some of the patients who might be a good candidate for a single ventricle are patients with an inadequate ventricle size. So that would be our hypoplast. Schoen syndrome, patients who have an inadequate atrioventricular valve, so for example, if it's a PAIVS patient, can generally corrected transposition, um, depending on some specific factors for them, how their left ventricle looks, um, how old they are. If they're older age, when they present for this repair, there's a higher probability of left ventricular failure and operative mortality, so they might be actually better off with it single ventricle repair. Um, some other kind of contraindications to pursuing the full biventricular repair, um, specifically for congenitally corrected transposition, include dextrocardia, anomalous coronaries, or an inlet VSD versus a protoventricular VSD. So lots of factors for somebody to think about when they're deciding which pathway the patient should be going down. Some other Patients who might be better off with a single ventricle, patients with an unbalanced AV canal. So remember, if, um, depending on your, your program and your cardiologist and your surgeon, they probably have numbers if the, if the canal is greater than 70, 30, which, which side it's um, committed to, they might decide that that's too unbalanced to pursue the full biventricular repair. If you've got a double outlet right ventricle with a non-committed BSD. Um, and so some of these surgeries, it's not that they couldn't be completed with a biventricular repair, but they might, for example, the one I just talked about would have a long uh, intracardiac baffle and would be complicated for reoperations. Heterotaxy patients with complex ventricular relationships and positioning, again, if those intracardiac baffles are going to be really complex whether or not you're actually going to be achieved, able to achieve what you want to achieve. So next I kind of want to talk a little bit just about the timeline of single ventricle palliation, so the history of this repair. So interestingly, I found out when I was doing this research for this presentation, the Fontan procedure was actually introduced to treat tricuspid atresia 
not hypoplastic left heart. I didn't know that. Um, so that procedure was created in the 60s, and then in the 80s came about um, the lateral tunnel Fontan and also the introduction of the bidirectional lens. So taking it from a one repair to a more of a staged repair. And then in the 90s came about the extra cardiac Fontan and also the Fontan fenestration. Um, and that's also when some interest came up in pursuing these complex biventricular repairs. And that interest really came about because of um, there were some poor outcomes following Fontan. Some of them had to do with poor preparation of the patients before the Fontan. It kind of was uncertain of how to best medically um, prepare them for the surgery. Um, if they had elevated pulmonary pressures and protein losing enteropathy, cirrhosis, all of these things kind of were complicating Fontan repairs. Um, in the 2000s, there, and really up until now, there's really the extracardiac Fontan and the lateral tunnel Fontan are both being used. Um, and then there's more um, refined management of single ventricle patients. And then at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the future ideas out there that might be used to manage these patients. So I'm going to go through this a little bit. This is kind of showing the evolution of the Fontan procedure and how this repair has been done. So if you see the first image, that's a atriopulmonary Fontan. Um, you can see it involves a direct connection between the right atrium and the pulmonary artery. And so the idea behind this was that the hyper the um, hypertrophy right atrium could act as a pump, so you would be having some pump power to the lungs and not just all passive circulation. Um, but really, this, this idea kind of morphed into the lateral tunnel fontan, but it did have some poor results due to lots of arrhythmias, you know, involving that atrium, um, and the flow dynamics really were not ideal. So it kind of evolved into the idea of this lateral tunnel fontan, um, which includes, I think there's another better photo on that slide. So let's, let's go to the next slide. So you can see that that second photo, that's your lateral tunnel, which includes a baffle inside of the atrium. So it kind of allows your fontan circulation to go through the atrium. Um, and then on the, the far right, you've got the extracardiac, which is a conduit around and outside of the heart. So those are kind of our our choices for technique for Fontan. And then on this slide, I wanted to show the Fontan fenestration. So some centers will use a fenestration, which is really basically just a pop-off between your Fontan conduit and the heart. Um, there are pros and cons of this. I'm going to we'll go to the next slide. We'll talk about this a little more. So, the benefits, you have a lower central venous pressure, again, because you have that, that fenestration that's kind of a pop-off. It also can give you better preload for your single ventricle because you've got some flow coming directly across there from the Fontan circulation. It can be more important in the immediate post-op period when your patient will still have some depressed myocardial function and higher pulmonary pressures. Um, and it's also been used in failing Fontan patients to improve their physiology, to give them that fenestration um, later on. For challenges, it is a persistent right to left stent, so you're going to have a lower saturation with that fenestration open than you would if you didn't have it, um, which could lead to some cyanosis. In some patients, closure of that uh, fenestration helps them. It gives them improved exercise tolerance, better growth, and reduced need for cardiac meds. So there's not really a clear answer on if a Fontan fenestration will help your patient or not, there's pros and cons to both. Um, but everyone agrees that if it closes, uh, unplanned closes shortly after surgery, then that's not good, and those patients usually do not do well. So which type of Fontan is best? As I said, right now, pretty much the, the ones that are in use are the lateral tunnel and the extra cardiac. And so some of the advantages for the lateral tunnel um, it can be performed in a smaller and younger patient. It has some growth potential, um, and it but it does require aortic cross clamping. So if your patient has some other complex um, 
anatomy that you also need to address some intracardiac work at the time of surgery, you may be cross-linking already anyway. Um, extra cardiac content is going to reduce the suture line to avoid that prosthetic material in the right atrium, which will lead to lower arrhythmia and pacemaker rates. It may or may not require aortic cross-clamping, um, but it does have a lack of growth potential, so it could require a reoperation. So right now, in the last decade, approximately 12% of Fontan procedures are lateral tunnel, and approximately 88% are extracardiac. So most uh, programs are preferring to do the extracardiac Fontan. So of course, I had to throw this in here. Um, I think you guys know that I came from Boston Children's Hospital, so I'm a little biased um, when it comes to them. But Boston Children's is one of the centers that does continue to prefer the lateral tunnel Fontan, and they published this paper recently in 2020 talking about their uh, improved outcomes with the lateral tunnel compared to the extracardiac. Um, some of the things that they showed were they had lower early and midterm mortality, better results in exercise stress testing for the lateral tunnel, despite the fact that they had longer operation times and more frequent concomitant procedures and less favorable preoperative characteristics. So even though they had less favorable kind of patients that they were giving the lateral tunnel, they still had better outcomes and longer freedoms than Fontan failure. Their extracardiac group really had a higher rate of that premature Fontan fenestration closure, which I said everyone agrees that that is not good for any patient. Um, but really what I think this shows is that, um, like any other surgical repair, what your team is good at and what your ICU is good at managing makes a big difference. So if your team is really good at lateral tunnel and that's something that you've kind of honed in on and perfected the, the care of those patients, then you're going to have great outcomes for that. If your team is better at extra cardiac content, then you'll probably have better outcomes for that. Um, and ICU management is really important. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the morbidity and mortality associated with these single ventricle patients. Um, basically, when we talk about morbidity and mortality, we can talk about either the failing Fontan end of the spectrum or the interstage mortality, which is mortality that can happen um, when your patient is between stage repairs and doesn't make it to the Fontan. So to do that, I found this great paper out of CHOP, um, and they kind of talked about they were talking about mortality after the new orbit procedure, so that, that's after that first surgery. And what they did, which was interesting, is they broke all of their data into these different eras um, or time periods, and they kind of based it on developments in how they treated the new orbit procedure. So their first era um, is when they began the use of the superior cable pulmonary conduit, which, which is the bidirectional glen more commonly. So when they started using bidirectional glen and further staging the operation. Um, and then in the mid-90s to early 2000s, they had a big change in their surgical team, so that kind of changed their, their outcomes for a little while. And then in 2002, they began to use the SANO versus the, instead of the BT shunt. Um, and then in 2011, they began this interstage monitoring program, um, which help them monitor their patients, even if their patients were at home, um, after they had the Norwood, before they were coming for their cleanse. And they also decreased the time that they had between the Norwood and the cleanse, so they kind of tightened up that little interval right there. So for them, across all of these eras, their average mortality for these patients was 10.8%. Um, that's across all of them, but then in their most recent era, they've actually got their interstage mortality down to 4.6%. So they, they've really kind of honed in on the timing of their operations and also this interesting um, interstage monitoring program, which is kind of still to be seen, I think, how much that will help them in the future. But they in, uh, improved their management to get their mortality down to 4.6%, which is great. Um, so then we'll talk a little bit about the morbidity and mortality after the Fontan. So this is what you usually hear about um, as far as morbidity and mortality for these patients. So to do that, um, I found this great paper out of Children's Hospital of Wisconsin talking about Fontan palliation in the modern era and some of the factors that impact morbidity and mortality. So 
According to this paper, the, the overall operative survival for a Fontan procedure is 98%, which is great. Um, but there is 16% morbidity. So some of those morbidities include heart failure, arrhythmias, protein using enteropathy, stroke, and thrombus. So the, the factors that impacted whether or not your patient had any of these morbidity events um, in this particular study were length of stay, cross tent time, and the presence of the fenestration. Interestingly, whether or not your patient had a left ventricular or right ventricular morphology did not affect the event-free survival. So whether, whether they were a single left or a single right ventricle didn't make a difference. Long-term freedom from transplant is quoted anywhere from 50 to 70 percent. And the 15-year Fontan failure rate is approaching 20 percent. So again, if you're an adult perfusionist, you may be seeing more of these previous Fontan patients either failing or coming for their transplants. So let's talk a little bit about the failing Fontan. What does that mean? So these patients are going to have a progressive decline in exercise tolerance. They're going to have heart failure. They're going to develop arrhythmias and have some thromboembolic complications. So why does this happen? What's leading to this failure of their Fontan circulation? So some of the things that are going to contribute to this, they're going to have an increase in systemic afterload. And a big one is this mismatch between contractility and afterload. So due to changes in their systemic circulation and limitations in their ventricular performance, they're going to have this mismatch between contractility and afterload. Um, the, especially if they're a right ventricular a right ventricle patient, so if they were a hypoplastic left and their right ventricle is now the systemic, the right ventricle has some differences in its morphology from the left ventricle that don't allow it to be you know, as efficient as a pumping, um, systemic pumping ventricle. They're going to have an increase in pulmonary vascular resistance, so lack of pulsatile flow and the ventilation perfusion mismatch in the lungs. Also, subclinical thromboembolisms; those things can all uh, those things can all contribute to a rising pulmonary vascular resistance. So, remember, with the Fontan, we have passive blood flow to our lungs, so a rising pulmonary vascular resistance is going to be really detrimental in getting blood flow to the lungs. And if we don't get enough blood flow to the lungs, we're not going to get enough blood coming back to the heart. So, if we don't have enough blood coming back to the heart, now we don't have enough volume to pump out. So, that's this rise in TVR is very bad in Fontan patients. The systemic ventricular function is determined by the preload limitations. That's kind of what I was just saying. If we don't get enough blood to the lungs and then we don't get enough blood from the lungs to the heart, we're not going to have enough volume. Um, and the preload afterload mismatch, so again, not enough preload um, is going to be a big factor in their cardiac output. Um, versus that normal contractility response in a normal heart, which kind of helps determine um, cardiac index, they really are struggling with a lack of preload. They're also going to have a chronic elevation of systemic venous pressure um, and arrhythmias and liver and GI function. So all of these things are going to contribute to this failing Another big factor in how well your patient's going to do with the Fontan is the function of their atrioventricular valve. So if you have AV valve regurgitation, previously that was considered to be a contraindication to Fontan palliation. So remember, when you have a single ventricle heart, that single ventricle has to provide cardiac output to the whole body and really to the lungs as well. So if there is some regurge in that valve, that ventricle is going to have a really hard time providing enough output to the body and to the lungs. So AV valve regurg in Fontan is really kind of the bane of your existence. Um, it's hard to generate enough flow if you've got that regurg. So that's why, like I said previously, that was considered to be a hard contraindication. Um, so even with more advanced techniques, there's, these, there's still suboptimal results for AV valve repair and replacement. Um, the short-term mortality um, varies between 9 and 73% with 
for long-term survival if you have aging bowel bleakers. Um, other contributing factors are chronic volume overload and structural abnormalities to that AV valve. And patients with AV valve failure are twice as likely to develop spontane failure. The other question is the timing of the intervention. When should we fix or replace that AV valve? Should it be done at the first surgery? Should it be done later on? Um, and there's a, a reference out of Brazil from 2019 that showed that interventions on the valve during that initial palliation were much more difficult to manage um, and were an independent risk factor for mortality before discharge. So really, the repair at the time of the plan or plantain is more preferable, and that's usually what you'll see. Another issue, which is great to be aware of if, if you're managing a plantain patient, is that a lot of these patients have coagulation anomalies. So the abnormalities in coagulation are very common among single ventricle patients. Up to 62% of single ventricle patients have some coagulation, um, coagulopathy, I should say, um, thrombotic and thromboembolic events, are between 7 and 33%. So the causes for this appear to be acquired, not hereditary. Um, and some of these things are altered hemodynamics dynamic factors, so we've got some, there could be areas of stasis, there's non-pulsatile circulation, atrial arrhythmias, fungus flow, all of these things um, can contribute to coagulopathies, there's abnormal surfaces, you might have um, prosthetic material and surgical scars, and chronic cyanosis and polycythemia also can induce a prothrombotic state. So. The abnormalities that can be seen include alterations in levels of protein C, protein S, antithrombin, and factors 2, 5, 7, 8, and 10. There can also be increased platelet reactivity. So again, if you're seeing one of these patients, keep in mind that they might not behave the way that you think they would um, when it comes to your anticoagulation and your ACTs. Another complicating factor I'm just going to briefly talk about is protein losing enteropathy. Um, and this is due to congestion, gastrointestinal tract, which leads to dysfunction of the intestinal barrier. So basically, that congestion just causes the barrier to not function the way it should, and you get a loss of solutes and serum proteins across your intestinal barrier. All right. So one other technique that I wanted to talk about is this special technique, which you might hear, uh, one and a half ventricle repair. So what does that mean? What's a one and a half ventricle repair? So this is kind of a compromise between a single ventricle and a biventricular repair. And right now it's mostly considered for patients with a moderately hypoplastic left ventricle. So patients that have hypoplastic left heart or Schoen syndrome or double outlet right ventricle where the right ventricle is just moderately hypoplastic. They have to have a preserved right ventricular function, um, and it, it would be probably a failing Fontan patient who would be a candidate for this repair, um, or a complex anatomy where the biventricular repair is infeasible or just would be too complicated to manage. So this repair involves taking down the Fontan, leaving the Glenn circulation, and then doing a hemi mustard to baffle the IVC to the left atrium, closing the other intracardiac shunt, and then doing a left ventricle to PA shunt. So this seems like a lot, but basically what we're doing is we're leaving the Glenn circulation so that we've got some passive blood flow still coming to the lungs, but we're also making that moderately hypoplastic left ventricle be a pumping ventricle to the lungs. So we've left the right ventricle as a systemic ventricle, and now we've got it's a one and a half repair because we've got the left ventricle pumping some of the return from the body to the lungs, but also we still have some passive flow to the lungs with that Glenn circulation. Um, this could potentially be used on more patients in the future. It's not really being used that much right now, um, but what really needs to be determined is that lower limit of how hypoplastic the left ventricle can be to still function in this capacity and what volume it needs to be able to manage. So this could be a future um, thing that we might see even in our, our older or our adult one-hand patients. 
Of course, heart transplantation is an option for some patients. Um, Fontan patients who have had heart failure, intractable arrhythmias, protein losing enteropathy, or plastic bronchitis, all these patients might be um, going down the heart transplant route. The prognosis with transplantation is better for patients that have cardiomyopathy than patients that have congenital heart disease. And it's better for other forms of congenital heart disease than Fontan failure. So we kind of we're starting off at a kind of a a deficit here. If we're a Fontan needing a heart transplant, already our outcomes are lower than other heart transplant patients. Of course, there there is always the consideration some patients could go straight to transplant without going through the Fontan um, pathway. So what kind of patients might we put straight to transplant? Those include hypoplasts with an intact atrial septum, patients with um, tricuspid regurge or AV valve regurge, premature infants, patients with coronary artery anomalies, um, and the specific MSAA variant of hypoplastic left heart, which is at a high risk for coronary fistulas. So all of those patients have some factors that make them really poor Fontan candidates, so they might go straight for heart transplant. Now, why would we not put everyone for a heart transplant versus doing a complex biventricular repair or Fontan? And Obviously, the reason is because then a lot of people will be sitting on the list and um, at risk for dying while waiting for transplant. So right now, up to 25% of pediatric patients die while waiting for heart. So we can't put everyone on the transplant list right off the bat. All right, and last, I'm going to talk about some future treatments. Where are we headed on this single ventricle um, physiology? So first, I'm going to talk about this really interesting um, treatment that came out of Japan, this study. So in this study, what they did, um, the study is from 2013 to 2016 in Japan. What they did was at the time of the initial surgery, so that Norwood surgery, they harvested some autologous tissue, and they did a lot of complex um, genetic uh, science. And they expanded it for to get these cardiosphere-derived cardiocytes, or CDCs. And they used those for cell therapy um, that they gave approximately a month after the surgery. And they injected it um, into the coronaries. And so basically, it's just injecting these cardiac progenitor cells, kind of like stem cells, into the coronaries um, to help try to help improve the ventricular function. So. They did show improvement in ventricular function, especially in patients who had reduced ejection fraction. So those patients that their, their biggest issue was their um, cardiac output and ejection fraction, this therapy did help. So the long-term outcomes of this therapy are still unknown. It's relatively a new um, technique. Um, but it could be a new frontier for single ventricle uh, management or even for biventricular patients that have depressed ventricular function. And then the other um, kind of really interesting study that I found is this group that did this analysis. Now this was just a, it was a, a lab study. It wasn't on uh, patients, but they did in vitro analysis of using a PD Magra Centromag for right-sided failing Fontan support. So this was really interesting, a new way to use the Centromag and PDMAG. So real quick, before I tell you exactly what they did, let's go to the next slide and just talk again a little bit more about the Fontan failure. So we talked about what contributes to Fontan failure. But really, we have to think about it in kind of two different big categories. So you can have your Fontan failure mostly due to comp compromised ventricular function. So if you're right ventricle or your whichever ventricle is in the systemic position is failing, um, you could have a typical ventricular assist device could be used. If your big issue is poor ventricular filling, so like what I talked about, we have that reliance on the preload. If you're not getting enough preload, then a, a traditional ventricular assist device really isn't going to help you because your function might be okay, but you're not getting enough volume. So we have to find a way to get you more volume. So if you have poor ventricular filling, you have a high 
PBR, low flow across that Fontan circulation, then you might be a candidate for this theoretical Fontan assist device. So that's using your Centromagra PDMAG in the systemic venous position and trying to increase flow across that Fontan circulation. So the goal is to decrease your IVC pressure and increase cardiac output. So this diagram um, looks a little bit complicated, but this shows their, their lab setup. And basically they had on the left there, you can see the piston pump that was representing their systemic single ventricle. Um, and then they've got, um, they've got these kind of buckets set up as the different um, places. They've got the atrium, the IVC, the SVC. And then they've got different things representing the valves. Um, to show the, the flow, basically. So you can see that this is set up to be the flow of a single ventricle heart, all coming from one ventricle. Um, and then in the kind of the center there, you can see that's the spot where they put the central mag or the PD mag. And what they did was they put it, um, they put it so that it could pull flow from the IVC and SVC and put that flow into the lungs. So this would hopefully help with eventually with preload, because if you get more blood flow into the lungs, then you can have more blood flow going back to the heart to do your cardiac output. So they used an in vitro model, and then they also used computer models so that they could do five different patients across a range of sizes and anatomies using the central mag and the PD mag. So did it work? They did find that the, with the PD mag, they only had limited success. There was a lot of recirculation in the Fontan circulation um, that caused SVC pressures. The central mag was only successful in reducing the SVC and IVC pressure and increasing cardiac output. So it's possible in the future that they could create an application to support a failing Fontan if you had preserved ventricular function, just helping get that preload into the heart. Um, this would avoid the need to take down or modify the Fontan circulation. Um, and it would probably not be feasible for patients that have really high PVR that can't be managed medically because it's, you, you wouldn't be able to get enough um, flow into the lungs. But again, another future application that could be a potential that we might see um, another way of using VADS to help our patients. And these are some of the the reference papers that I that I used for the presentation, and that's all I have. Wow. 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 That's that is very impressive, Katie. Comprehensive um, for sure. Yeah, and frightening for me. <laughs> yes. Okay. So I, it shows I, me how much I don't remember. Oh, it shows me how much I don't. Yeah, how much I don't know. Well. Period. You I'm know. Sure, I mean, we were told some of this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, which brings up. Um, do you have any questions? Because I've got a whole. I have well, a cornucopia of questions. Go ahead. So when you talk about the um, us seeing these ad adult congenitals, I know that <clears throat> some of the big medical center uh, institutions have hired um, some very gifted, very capable surgeons for this very specific purpose, and that is managing the adult congenital, people that have survived mm -hmm. through these procedures and now there are adults needing other things done. Um, are we really going to ever see that, you think, out in the non-medical center community? Yeah. That's uh, what I, I was wondering. I guess possibly as an emergency. And if we did, um, of course, if it was an emergency and couldn't be transferred, which seems like the more appropriate thing to do, um, what kind of resources do we have? Who would we call? Because clearly, you know, there's going to potentially be drainage issues. If it's a valve um, that needs to be worked on, a lot of questions about where to cannulate, how to cannulate, what to expect in terms of, you know, be, the field being flooded where they can't operate would be one of my primary concerns, emptying the heart enough and being able to actually see to do whatever repair you had to do. So what, what do you say to that? Well, I think that you're... You're probably right. You probably won't see, I wouldn't imagine you would see a lot of these patients at a non-academic center. Um, I think most of them are probably preferentially going to go to those bigger centers that have um, 
either a pediatric surgeon or an adult surgeon who's doing adult conge or congenital surgeries. Um, I think that your surgeon will probably be reaching out to other other surgeons at an academic center for, for advice and um, certainly, you know, you could reach out to your local academic center um, to the perfusionist there and hear what they had to say also. But I think you're right, it probably would be, I think it would be more of just managing the patient until they went to a bigger center. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, if you had to do a, for example, if you had to do some mechanical circulatory support for them, which would be the best way to do that? We would want to know. Um, so I would suggest that people perhaps watching the show, and it's actually, it's actually going to encourage me to find some. Of course, I do know a few people, right? We know a few people here at Houston. Well, we're lucky but enough I would to be in a large city. So right. of course, we've crossed paths with some, some right. people who are special, to, you know, specialized in this field. Sure, but if somebody's traveling through, let's say, in a more remote area, mm -hmm. and ends up at a hospital that actually does heart surgery and they're failing, you're going to want to be able to find somebody pretty quickly to help yeah, you get through you that. You might want to put them in your uh, reference book. Absolutely. And actually contact. call them and, and develop at least some type of connection mm. um, so that you actually know somebody in a bigger institution, you know, because I think that can happen. Um, I would like to get, do you want to go with one of your questions? No, because mine's sort of off topic, but she's an expert, so I'm going to ask her something about that. Okay. Um, I have a question about organ availability because obviously, you know, you have to operate on these patients and this, the, all of these very exotic operations mm -hmm. to create these babbles and shunts is to buy time for either it's a sustainable procedure where the patient can grow with it and that they may not need it, something else. But a lot of this sounds like it's for preparation and survival until heart transplantation. Okay, so mine feeds off of that, so. Yeah, so go ahead. Well, no, so it's, it's. My curiosity is what about organ availability for these kids? I'll add on so you can just kind of continue on. So uh, what I wanted to know is once you, um, once your patients get their heart transplant, whether it be initially because that's what was best for them or, you know, as a, um, it's a step later after a few procedures, how, how long do those hearts typically last for them? I know some of it has to do with how much growing they still have to do, but I, I kind of remember way back when, when I was learning about this, that it's, it's often not life-sustaining for very long. It's a certain number of years, and then they need another they heart They outgrow trans their graft, mm -hmm. or outgrow, because the, the, the transplanted heart won't grow with you, or will it? If it's denervated, will it? Will it grow with you? Yeah, maybe you could just talk a little bit on some of these things because I find this really fascinating. So I definitely, I won't say that I'm an expert in all things heart transplantation, but I have heard that if you transplant patients, a smaller patient, actually the heart can last longer than you oh. think. So, you, so some of our patients here that have gotten transplants when they're only, you know, two to five years old, actually I think that the transplant docs expect that it could last them into their 20s. Oh, um, wow. So, but, of course, not not always, but it could it could last. It has the potential, I think, yeah. I think that, like, any transplant, you know, you're going to have you have a certain time limit on that heart, mm -hmm. whether it's 10 or 20 years, and then you might be looking for another transplant or some other assist device. Um, with your single ventricle patients, it's kind of a complicated decision because you have to think about what's been going on in their body the whole time that they've had this single ventricle circulation. So they might have had, they probably had, if they're failing Fontan, they probably had a lot of congestion in their liver. They could have had congestion in their upper body, in their brain. So somebody who's much smarter than me has to make the decision on whether this patient is really going to do well, even with a new heart the rest of their body and the rest of their organ systems um, going to be able to handle that. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a factor that's going to play into whether these patients are going to eventually go down the transplant route or are they going to stay as a single ventricle or Fontan circulation for their whole life. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, mm -hmm. I think, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, 
Yeah. No, it's very good. Very it, good. It does. What and if I can do a follow up real quick, mm -hmm, please. Since you were talking about you know the Fontan possibly being the solution for these single single ventricle patients to last them their whole life, and I know there's a whole lot of things that come into play for this, but typically speaking, what would be considered their life expectancy? Do they? How long do they live with these types of things? if it all goes well and there's no major complications? So I think that that is hard to say. I think that as techniques progress, you'll see, you know, a progression in life expectancy for these patients. Um, so like I said, the, the techniques and the management have really come, changed a lot from the late 60s to now. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that there are patients that are living into their 20s, 30s, 40s. Wow. Um, I don't know if there's patients living a lot past that, mm -hmm. but there could be in the future, again, yeah. with, with improved management. Um, it's really hard to predict. I've heard one of our, our surgeons here say that it's really hard to predict whose Fontan is going to fail and not. There's not a lot of good, you know, data. So unfortunately, you know, they do they do the best they can, and mm -hmm. it's not always predictable who's going to do really well with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, organ, so that's very mm, encouraging. Yes, absolutely. So organ availability, um, and I'm going to ask a very controversial question, um, but I think it's germane and relevant and, uh, and um, should be discussed. Do you guys have any thoughts on xenotransplantation, much in the way Dr. Bailey did the baboon heart in Baby Fay, um, and uh, in, in order to supplement the organ availability that I, I would imagine is there is a shortage of organs because if there wasn't a shortage of organs you would have a lot of more transplants than perhaps these exotic procedures that you're doing with all of these uh, rel uh, fontans and, and, and shunts and baffles etc. I would think that the advancement of ventricular assist devices would be more what's going to help fill that gap probably than xenotransplantation. transplantation. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's constant evolution of that and, and the pads being available for the pediatric population, which is a whole kind of separate issue, right, because a lot of the VADs are made for bigger patients. Mm -hmm. um, but I would see that in the future hopefully helping kind of fill that gap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, I think that xenotransplantation is a very controversial topic for a lot of reasons, mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure. I, I had another question, which again is, and, and I could understand about the, the, the VADs or total artificial heart and so mm -hmm. forth, where that'd be nice if you could just click plug and play, and that's all there was to it. But you know, they have all of their limitations as well. You know, VAD thrombosis is such a huge problem. And then of course, sizing and everything else is a big concern too. Mm -hmm. Um, but this is a this is a bit on the controversial side. The capability of these children that we do, and we do a lot of them, are these normal? You know, normally mentating children are they? Do they end up? Is there a disproportionate number that are special needs, are or are they otherwise basically normal children just with really bad cardiac? Uh, anatomy and, and physiology because of a congenital defect? Is it isolated, in other words, or does it really, is it almost a whole picture? I think there's a spectrum. I think that some patients, you know, their congenital abnormality is, that's their, their main problem, and they might have a chance to have a fairly normal life. I think that you would find that there's adults out there that had congenital heart surgery and you don't even know. Um, some of them have a lot of other issues, right, which might be developmental, but they also might just be other, you know, anatomical things that they have going on. Some of them have, you know, there's a huge variety of really not well-known genetic disorders that these patients have that affect, like, lots of other areas of their body. So some of them, you know, they're not going to have a quote-unquote normal life. Some of them, I think, have a great chance to have a pretty normal life. And I think that operating on them, you know, 
we have to also look at doing all of these surgeries as helping not just the patients that we're helping, but helping future patients as mm -hmm. well, right? Mm -hmm. Understanding yeah. things. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Is there a, is there though a a percentage? In other words, what percentage of children that present with significant significant enough cardiac malformations also have developmental uh, uh, abnormalities. How, what, what is the ratio of that? I don't know what that number is. I'm sure there is data out there, but I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I mean, it's a tough question, but you know, I'm curious as to, as to that, that part of it, hmm. you know? Yeah, I don't know. But it does seem like anytime something is genetic, it's, it's more rare that it's an isolated thing mm -hmm. versus a thing that affects many things. But yeah, just absolutely. because it affects many things, again, doesn't mean that, you know, they, an altered life doesn't mean a, 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 a meaningless life. Correct. I, I totally agree with you. Right. I mean, I think that that shows the, I mean, at the end of the day, the, the real message to all of this is the level of our compassion as a society. Mm -hmm. You know, but I do think also um, it is important for us to take into consideration quality of life before we endeavor in some of these things. And we deal with that every day in our patient population who may be young, still have a whole life in front of them. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, how do you, how do you measure quality of life? For that some person, it may be this thing, and for someone else, it's something else. Correct. It is very, very, very individualized. And then oh. you have the families. You have the parents that you're well, taking into consideration and right. uh, other loved ones. I mean, it's a mm -hmm. very complex issue. But I think the bottom line is we are such a compassionate society, and uh, we value human life of, of any type, and we'll do everything we possibly can to preserve it and extend it as best we can. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, if you're just brain dead and there is no quality of life, I think you have to make those very tough decisions and mm -hmm. say, this is enough. We just, it's, it's torturing, this is torture, we have to stop. But that's a very emotional decision. Picking, selecting patients, uh, who gets and who doesn't get, is not something for the faint of heart. That is a very, very hard thing to have to do. And uh, we all, but we all get put in that position. I mean, that is what we do. Mm. So with that said, any other questions? No, that's really it. Katie, you are clearly the smartest person in the room. Mm. And uh, I don't think you realize <laughs> who you, you can shake your head and smile. I appreciate that, but it's true. And we value so much and appreciate so much your willingness to do this and uh, be a part of this program. It's, it's, you've really added a new dimension to it. So we really appreciate have. you a great deal. Oh wait, once they get put on CMAG circuit, as you illustrated, what is the next step for the patient? Where is it leading to? Okay, so John had a question is, once you do that Centromag circuit that you showed, what is the next step for the patient? What is your long, what, what is the next step? So that one, remember that was First of all, that was a lab study, right? That hasn't actually been done on a patient, but I imagine that if it was done on a patient, it would be waiting for a transplant. Yeah, so mm -hmm. it might mm -hmm. be prolonging their Fontan procedure right. so that it doesn't fail so that they can, you know, get mm -hmm. to a transplant or, you know, mm -hmm. wait a number of years to get to a transplant is yeah. kind of how I took it. Well, the other thing that I recognized out of it, at least, is in a lab, if you did, were to do that, um, you could really sort of learn how mu if the ventricle is beating with this particular strength, we'll just say that its contractility is X, whatever X is, and we're flowing through this thing, what I've understood from it is I can now predict what volume is going to do for increasing flow here or there. How can we maybe adjust the size of these various different communications that we've developed uh, through your Fontan or whatever? If I make it smaller, if I make it larger, if I add a second one, will it help, will it hurt? I, that's what I got out of it. Is that what you were doing with it? Well, I think that um, they were specifically trying to see if a VAD in a different, you know, used in a different way, in a different position could help increase the preload to the heart. Mm -hmm. But I think what 
saying is also true is that like lots of medical research is done using computer modeling mm -hmm. to decide you know the shapes of conduits and um, the sizes of things and even you know some centers have 3D modeling also where they can print you know a heart head of surgery and kind of look at it you know in their hands and see what's going to fit and what they're going to do so I think all of these things are you know being used some now and they're going to be utilized a lot more in the future. But I think that if if a patient was put on a central mag in the way that they're describing, it would be waiting, you know, they'd be, you know, listed as 1A on the transplant list waiting for a transplant. Okay. You obviously wouldn't be able to go home on a central mag. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. Well, thank you. Katie, thank you again very much. And uh, we're looking forward to a lot more of your programs. We, I, I enjoy them tremendously. And I know our audience does too. Great. Oh. Thank you. Oh, we need a, uh, and we need, Magic just told me, we need a professional photo of you and a short bio because we don't have that on our website yet. And we really do need to have that uh, so that we, you know, of course, then I can actually introduce you every once in a while and not have to rely on that. But it's been okay. a pleasure and thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone, and uh, we are just uh, going to get right into Journal Club after Katie's uh, really informative presentation um, about single ventricle um, corrections, uh, specifically with Fontan. Today for Journal Club, we are going to be talking about a pretty interesting article, but not for the reasons that I thought it was going to be interesting. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I had the same problem. Yeah. Um, so... First off, uh, this article was published in Perfusion Journal, um, and the title of it is um, Alternative Techniques of uh, Long-Acting Cardioplegia Delivery Results in Less Hemodilution. Um, and it was uh, published uh, out of a hospital, a group of uh, people out of a hospital in Singapore. I'm not going to attempt to say their names, but they're there on the screen. You can see it was a very um, robust group of people who contributed in this. I'll take one moment. I believe John Ingram has just joined us, so welcome, John. Uh, we're glad to have you so that we can see you now. Um, morning. Good morning. Okay, let me just read the abstract to you. Um, so this uh, uh, background, the preparation of del nido cardioplegia and its delivery technique can cause significant hemodilution. The resultant effects from hemodilution are largely proportionate to the use of a dual circuit. We opted for a custom disposable single cardioplegia circuit instead of a dual circuit. We'll get into their methods more um, as we go on, but I'll talk real quick about just the results so you can kind of know where we're going with this. They had um, a decent size uh, a population that they looked at. It's a, a retrospective study of 177 patients who underwent um, cardiac surgery with del nido cardioplegia. Um, 76 of them uh, were um, valve only, five were um, uh, coronary artery bypass grafts only. They looked at ultrafiltration utilization, which was 132 patients, about 63%, and their um, filtrate volume was uh, just over two liters. The alternative technique of del nido cardioplegia delivery was adopted by their institution, which is uh, National University Hospital. It'll be abbreviated as NUH moving forward. And they advocate for a single pump, uh, single circuit system. The um, institutional data was highlighted for safe delivery of del nido um, using this technique in a range of procedures. And we'll get to the conclusion a little bit more C as we go. Could you go back to that one second? Absolutely. Very interesting, though, their range of ultrafiltration. Their mean was 2,200, but they were 150 cc's all the way up to 9,500 cc's mm -hmm. is what I was read there, yeah. which I found very interesting because, of course, I want to know why would you have 
9,500 unless the patient is that fluid overloaded or you're giving them an off, you're doing Z-buff or you're doing something else. So I did find that interesting that that range was so wide, 150 to 9,500. Yes, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, I'll read you some um, excerpts from the article on okay. hemodilution as we go a little bit into this. All right. So I hope everyone has their glasses on if you can't see very well because some of these diagrams, they get pretty intricate. You can um, highlight too. You put your finger on it, remember, you get a, they get a laser light. Yeah. It, wait till you see these diagrams though. Okay, why was this paper, paper published? I actually want to read you specifically their objective because I thought it, it was pretty clear. Their objective was to describe their setup of the standard or describe a setup of the standard cardioplegia circuit used in NUH, their hospital, um, also called the NUH technique because they developed this circuit specifically for their hospital as well as present their retrospective data of patients who had received a del nido cardioplegia administered during heart surgery, just to shed some technical light on aspects associated with NUH's alternative technique of this delivery. Okay. So they didn't really have problems to be solved other than they just did kind of did a comparison of standard circuit compared to their circuit. And this is how they did it. All right, so their methods were um, the single cent uh, center retrospective study collected 177 patient data. They underwent the heart surgery at NUH in Singapore between January 2017 and April 2019. They collected demographic data, pre-existing health conditions, pre-operative, um, post-operative, they were all analyzed. Um, initial perioperative and early postoperative variables were analyzed as well. The, um, and then they looked at uh, different uh, indications of how well the myocardium was protected, uh, including acute renal failure, low cardiac output syndrome, and postoperative uh, IABP implantation. Okay, so here's our first diagram. And um, I'll just read to you real quick. This is their, this is their design. Um, you can see we've got a, sort of a, a standard on the left, you know, reservoir oxygenator, uh, drainage, uh, and uh, indication of coming from the patient. And then you see a whole lot of other stuff. So let me just tell you what you're looking at. So this is their, what they call standard cardioplegia circuit. And they've got various clamps and uh, ways to divert the way that they're going to be um, circulating things. The main thing I want to point out, and I'll go ahead and just uh, highlight the pin here, is that you're draining from the patient going into your reservoir. You've got your regular main pump to your oxygenator, and then coming around through, I guess they have an arterial filter still, and then back into the patient. So that's your basic circuit right there. Now if, um, let me just see real quick, and I'll change colors. Now we'll just look at the cardioplegia circuit. Okay, so you can see that their cardioplegia circuit starts up here at the top, but it's not coming from the reservoir. It's coming from right here. They've got bags of solution. Um, and here, you see they have a tubing clamp there to help control flow. Then it is flowing in through their cardioplegia pump, up through a cooling uh, mechanism bucket, through um, a bubble trap, and then coming back into the um, go to the patient depending on whatever the technique may be, whether it's integrate, retrograde. Then they also have another area where they have a bypass. So you come out of your bubble trap from the cardioplegia and you bypass going to the patient and you have a recirculation line that then comes back and comes through back to the um, reservoir, okay? All right, so it's very complicated. Then we'll look at one more thing. Yeah, I was like, where's the blood going to come from? Yeah. And I see it. I yeah. see it finally. Okay. So then you also have this, well, I'm not even going to get to that. Then let's say you're here. You're, here's your cardioplegia circuit. Go through the pump. Well, then you have another direction that is not even going to be that direction. It comes from this infusion pump where you could give um, – a different cardioplegia, it's a syringe pump, and then it runs through this ice bucket, through the bubble trap, and then to the patient, okay? All right, 
And then you have the blood. Yeah, no, I haven't even gotten you there yet. You haven't gotten there yet. Yeah. Okay, okay I've got to change colors again. All right. Now, you're wondering, how are we mixing blood with our uh, cardioplegia? Well, the blood is coming from here into your circuit, then in through here, and then mixing this way, and then going to the patient. Everybody got it straight now? So it took me quite a bit Why? of time. Why? Okay, well, let's, Why? Let, let, let's, let's just get through this. So this is their circuit they designed. And I'll just read you the description briefly. So um, the standard cardioplegia circuit at NUH has Robert's clamps that are closed to prevent the plasma light from entering the circulation. Uh, deoxygenated blood drains from the patient into the reservoir, which becomes oxygenated after passing through the oxygenator. The circuit draws oxygenated blood from the main cardi cardiopulmonary bypass circuit, which when they say circuit, they're meaning their cardioplegia circuit. Mm -hmm. It then passes through a segment of quarter-inch silicone pump boot uh, tubing that serves as a uh, dilutant for the cardioplegia concentrate infused by the syringe pump. The cardioplegia then passes through an ice bucket with an aluminum cooling coil and an inverse air trap before it's delivered to the patient. And that's a lot, right? Okay, all right, let's go to the next slide. Um, in case you're um, curious about their particular uh, preparation of del nido cardioplegia, here's the breakdown. I didn't see anything really that was too out of the ordinary. It looks pretty standard, but here it is for you to review. Okay, now we get a little more complicated. And I had to include these together because you, um, you really need to see one compared to the other. And the print's kind of small, so I I'll read to you what you need to know here. But figure two, so the one that would be on the left-hand side of the screen, is the arrangement of the clamps to homogenize and cool the Del Nido. So real quick, let's get a good color here. Like that one. All right, so if you'll see here, what you've got is <laughs> you have this part that is kind of interesting. So that is actually, an, an, it's a syringe that they're getting blood from, <laughs> uh, from the patient, and then infusing it in uh, into their cardioplegia circuit. Because you can see now that we don't have a, um, we, to think so it, let me read it how they word it here so they have a blood harvesting after aortic or femoral cannulation and so it's coming in through here controlled through a stopcock and then mixing in this way going into their del nido bag now you've got the del nido mixed with blood come flowing back out through their cardioplegia circuit running through their ice bucket through their um, bubble trap, and then depending on if you open or close a clamp, just continuing to circulate. Okay, so you see the loop there? All right. Now, if you look at the, uh, well, let me finish reading the description a little bit. So they say, after the autogalous blood is harvested through aortic or femoral arterial cannulation with a 50 cc syringe, it enters the um, Del Nido cardioplegia circuit where the Roberts clamp to the Del Nido solution is kept open to allow mixing. The mixture then flows through the roller pump, an ice bucket, and the inverse air uh, chamber, which is attached to a pressure monitor. The Roberts clamp to the patient's aortic root is closed while the homogenization of the Del Nido cardioplegia occurs until it's ready for cold delivery at a temperature between 4 and 7. So they've kind of got this continuous circulation thing going on, and uh, they, they believe that's superior. They think it, uh, for one thing, gives um, an even distribution of how cold the cardioplegia is. Okay? Mm. All right. Now let's look at the other side. So figure three, the one to the right. Um, this just shows, um, it's the same circuit, it just shows the reposition of the clamp to actually deliver the cardioplegia now. So after you've done figure one where you've circulated, you've mixed, you've got it cold, so now your flow is coming from your bag down through your roller head pump or whatever your pump is, through your ice bucket, 
air chamber, you monitor the pressure, and then your clamp's open, so then it flows this way and it's being delivered to the patient. All right, is everybody with me so far? Okay, so here's figure four, and what this one is talking about is it's looking at, it's not really modifying the circuit anyway, but it's highlighting a different, another feature of their circuit, which, uh-oh, uh -oh. uh -oh. what happened? Oops. We just went down. No, I think it was me, though. Oh, there we go. Oh. Yeah, I just hit the wrong button. We're back up. We're back up. That was easy. Okay, so what I want to draw your attention to is this part of the circuit here. You've probably been wondering, what's that syringe pump for? Yeah, I've been wondering that, too. Yeah. I've, I've been, yes, okay. still, still trying to figure this out. <laughs> so the syringe pump is really not a part of when we're talking about the Del Nido delivery. The syringe pump is an option to be able to give, uh, in their case, St. Thomas cardioplegia. Okay, so if you're looking at that one, then your cardioplegia solution is coming from here, then going through here, up through here. And you'll see um, when you're following the St. Thomas, it's the purple arrow on their diagram then going through here and here, and you got your purple blood from here initially, I guess I should have started there. And then it's mixing here, and then running through their ice bucket. Okay, so I'm gonna get to why, why we talked about that a little bit. So let's just go to their conclusions. I, I didn't really wanna highlight all of their preoperative data. They didn't find out anything extraordinary other than they compared their, their surgeries uh, they, uh, to uh, similar uh, similar surgeries at Cleveland Clinic and really the only thing that they did different is that they ri routinely use it in Singapore on uh, uh, bypass surgery where Cleveland Clinic did not. But the results were basically... So they're the using this on coronary, coronary bypass Everything. operations. Everything. Or valves. So Everything. these are not some kind of weird complex congenital like Katie. So this has no. nothing to do with congenitals. Nothing to do with congenitals, although it's just as complex as trying to understand it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so their conclusion for their study, which remember just was explaining their alternate technique um, uh, that they've adopted, is that a single pump, single circuit system, just for cardioplegia, that doesn't rely on the main circuit, if you will, um, is uh, they advocate for it. Their retrospective institutional data highlighted a safe delivery of Del Nido cardioplegia using their single pump system in a range of procedures. The NUH technique reduces hemodilution as well as provides other technical benefits including a steeper temperature gradient, a modification of circuit configuration to deliver another cardioplegia while on bypass, as well as reconfiguration of clamps to spike the base solution. I'm not really sure about that last conclusion. I didn't really get that from it. But I thought what was really interesting was their um, point that they could modify, they, that they have a modification to be able to switch up their cardioplegia type mid-procedure, mm -hmm. which is pretty interesting. I mean, okay. All I mean, right. I don't, I don't see that as very difficult to do. Well. Under, I mean, I mean, I don't really understand it. I, I mean, I read this article. Yeah. And I was, I was in pain. You can take the slides now, David. Yes. You were in I was pain. in pain. I was in pain actually reading it because I still don't understand their point. Their point is they're trying to highlight an unusual cardioplegia circuit setup that they have come up with mm -hmm. and that they find to be superior. And in what way? Well, I mean, why is it? So why do they so reduce hemodilution? I don't know how that. I don't know how that circuit reduces hemodilution. I've I've yet to figure it out. Well, um, okay. So help me understand. I'll touch on the hemodilution. Can I you do call one of these people? Is there a number we can call? <laughs> it took me quite I'm still a while to, to get through it. these diagrams. That's for sure. So uh -huh. we can talk a little bit about um, the hemodilution. Let me. What get did Dr. That. Cooley say? Keep it simple. Keep it simple, the yeah. KISS principle. Yeah. Um, okay, so they believe that their custom circuit setup allows for the rich, undiluted aortic blood to be collected straight from the patient, so it's not being mixed, uh, you know, in the regular bypass circuit, 
Um, so do you understand? Like it's not we're not hemodilution because when you go on bypass, you automatically have hemodilution, correct? Okay, so they're doing it to have a higher hematocrit in their blood, believing that there's increased oxygen availability. Yes. So that's the reason. Yes. Okay. Yes. Got Does it. that make more sense? Yes. Yes. That makes that makes yes. That no, it doesn't make any sense to me. But it <laughs> if that's their reason that's for their doing reason. it, um, that's very interesting. Okay, so here concept. here uh, I'll summarize all of this because I read this article, although it was not very long, many times, mm -hmm. trying to sort of get the gist of it. So they believe that by not diluting the blood that is mixed with the Del Nido, that it has higher oxygen carrying capacity, which they think is better protection for the heart. They believe by being able to continually circulate through a heater cooler that they're able to have a, a heat a, exchanger. Yeah. Oh, sorry, heat exchanger. I know what you meant. Um, that they are able to maintain a consistent lower temperature for the Del Nido, which they f they think is better protection mm -hmm. okay, for the for the heart, um, and they're able to do that because I, you know, a long time ago when I first came out, I. That was somewhere that I think it was a Terumo system that was crystalloid only that had a coil and an ice bucket and you mm -hmm. continually circulated yeah. and so it was really cold. And yeah. so I guess it's that kind of thought process that they're able to keep it really cold because mm -hmm. you have a way to circulate it because you are, you know, running a loop through your, your cardioplegia mm -hmm. system. Yeah, it was COBE. Was it, it COBE? It was COBE. Okay. The it's COBE coil. The COBE coil, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was just very brief part. Like I was sort of on my way in and it was on its way out. So yes. Yeah, um, so that's their that's their other thing, um, and then they um, believe that by being able to so there's three main advantages is what I got from this, the um, the what they call ultra uh, rich undiluted aortic blood that's mixed with their cardioplegia del nido, then they're able to keep it cold because they're continually circulating. And then, say you're through your most of your surgery, you know, you're 65 minutes or whatever, but the surgeon needs a little bit more time. Rather than giving additional Del Nido, a half dose or something like that, at that point, they're able to switch, you know, moving their clamps, and they can now give St. Thomas cardioplegia just a very small dose just to get to that 15 minutes or whatever the surgeon might need. Mm -hmm. And they think that that leads to um, better, uh, uh, better recovery. Myocardial protection. Yeah. And, well, and uh, uh, the ability for the heart to come back quicker because the Del Nido would knock it down more. Gotcha. Um, and actually, one more benefit that they um, thought that they had was, um, uh, oh, that because they have a, um, if you go back to uh, look at one of the diagrams, which we don't need to pull it up. You remember there was a double quickie prime spike system, and mm -hmm. one bag is plasma light, and one bag is their cardioplegia. Yes. The reason why they have that plasma light is they're able to then, uh, let's say you want to give uh, all the full amount of your bag of Del Nido, you know, there's always some left in the circuit, um, they're able to chase it through, and so they said that leads to um, full use, no waste, and uh, sometimes might save you even uh, having to give additional cardioplegia because you were able to give everything that was fully in the circuit. So I guess four benefits. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Very yeah. interesting. Uh, I, John, you got any thoughts on this? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> well, I'm glad you explained the benefits because I was scratching my head along the way, like Joe was, I think, <laughs> trying to figure out exactly what it all was they were trying to accomplish because um, – uh, this circuit is probably not for the faint of heart. I'd hate to be a traveler and walk in there and decide I'm going to run this circuit the first day. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of things to, to keep in mind there that can possibly go wrong, I would think. But, um, you know, I, I, uh, if they don't mind working this complicated, in other words, they've got to draw, I don't know, 60 cc syringe full of blood or maybe more than one to infuse into the Del Nido yeah. bag so they have straight blood as opposed to diluted pump blood. But by the way, <coughs> um, you know, if you have a pre hematic of 35 and you go on pump with a wrapping and low low prime, you probably only have a crit of 25 to 28 
in your pump anyway. So I'm not sure that it sounds good, but I don't know if you're gaining a whole lot by doing a whole lot of work there. You know what I mean? You're not diluting. When you go on pump, you're not having a 50% dilution of your hematocrit any, right. anymore, especially if you're wrapping. You have maybe a 5 to 8 point drop in your hematocrit if, you, if you're real conscious about prime and hema dilution, which they apparently seem to, seem to be. So I would wonder if they're, if they're doing some of those things. Mm -hmm. um, recirculating tardiplegia compared to a single pass, surely you can get it extremely cold. Um, <coughs> but I don't know that Dr. Del Nido recommends that it be given that cold. I thought he was a 15 degree, 18 degree delivery temperature mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. his recommended technique, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Well, they're doing obviously modified Del Nido. This well, is not Del Nido at all, because Del Nido is a crystalloid cardioplegia. It's not a blood cardioplegia. Well, no, you mix blood with it. But not very much. You, yeah, it's a one to four to one to five solution. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, in the reverse, so less blood, obviously. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, it's that, that, that part's not really that modified. No. No. Okay. So, no. So, so there's a question. How big of a bag is the Del Nido bag they're using? Um, yeah, they, uh, that's actually detailed here. So let me tell you real quick, because they talked about adding uh, the one to four blood cardioplegia ratio found in the Del Nido. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. I know that they said they added 250, so that would yeah. make it a, a, like a, a liter bag. So, um, right. yeah, yeah. So it's the standard liter bag or whatever that they were uh, well, talking about there. Well, I worked at a place that, you know, and as, as many times as they could, they would do, what did they call it? Uh, it's like free donation, but it's in the OR while the anesthesiologist is putting lines in. Mm -hmm. And before we've done anything, they donate a unit of blood, which is 250 cc's. But you could only do that on certain patients. Yeah. Right. You could only do that on patients that had a decent hematocrit. And we didn't do it, I'd say we tried doing it on everyone, but we probably only did it about 50% of the time. So if they're having to pull off 250 cc's, they said something about a syringe. That would be, uh, I don't know, four or five 60cc syringes. Right. But they're probably doing it through a donation bag, but maybe they're not doing it through a donation bag because then how would you mix it into the Del Nido bag? So, yeah, they're probably doing, so like I said, they're, uh, they're probably pulling off four, four 60cc syringes mm -hmm. is probably what they're doing and then having to mix that in the bag and then they can recirculate it. I mean, they're willing to go through a lot of additional time and energy to, uh, to do that. Um, but, you know, like I said, if, you, if you're not diluting the patient very much from their circuit, I don't know if you're gaining, what they're trying to gain is a lot more oxygenation capacity, and I'm not sure that's probably measurable with what they're doing. If well, they're I don't, even think, it's, I don't well, even think it's needed at that temperature. I mean, you have, I mean, that, you talk about luxurious oxygen, and of course mm -hmm. that cold, your oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, which we've talked about so much, has shifted so mm -hmm. far over your extraction rate for oxygen in the, at, at that temperature is going to be very, very low. And then whatever happened with the idea that, um, you know, blood viscosity increases with decreasing temperatures, and now mm -hmm. you're trying to give cardioplegia with a much higher hemoglobin or hematocrit in it that is much more viscous in the coronaries. Maybe it doesn't make any difference. It's so diluted at four to one yeah. or whatever it is, one to four mm -hmm. uh, ratio. But, you know, still, I mean, those are still considerations. There's reasons why um, if you're using profound hypothermia circulatory arrest that we don't want to start our circulatory arrest period with a hematocrit of 40. You know, you want to so have a lot less uh, dilution for obvious reasons because of viscosity. Go ahead. I was just going to say, y'all are really getting into the weeds of this. Let's just <laughs> be on the top here. Okay. That's way too complicated of a circuit. Do you know how many clamps are on that thing? I think at one point, one of the diagrams. It's an accident waiting to happen. Yeah, because you've yeah. got your Robert clamps. Did you click them? Yeah. Then you've yeah. got your stopcock, three-way stopcock. Is it positioned the right way? Mm -hmm. And then you've got your tubing clamps that you're also doing. Then you've got your Robert clamps up here, too, of an extra bag of fluid that mm -hmm. you could then inadvertently, mm -hmm. you know, give uh, plasma light instead of, there are so many things. And then let's not even talk about, I don't think there's any studies of mixing cardioplegias. Can you yeah. imagine if you oh, did I, that? I have no idea. I, I, I'll say this. I'm going to give the authors compliments for, for, for putting together 
some really nice looking graphs and diagrams. Very I mean, nice. was, there, was there an improvement in outcomes? I mean, what did the, what was their conclusion as far as well, their outcomes? Were they improved with this? They did find that uh, average um, published data, I guess, on um, hemo um, hemo concentration was using a hemo concentrator. Uh, with Del Nido was somewhere around 86%, um, and with uh, their technique, only 62%. Need for hemoconcentration. Right. I mean, such a benign, um, beneficial thing to do, but very low risk, high reward kind of yeah. kind of thing. So I I'm going to give them compliments on I mean, just publishing thinking this, of but it I'm going to ask a question. Yeah. I'm going to ask a, probably a very controversial question because uh -oh. I like to do that. <laughs> You know, should this article have ever been accepted by a mainstream journal to be published? I well, mean, really, I need to ask this question. Should that have been published? I, I mean, I think it's published, uh, published worthy. worthy. Yes, and here's why? why. Yeah. Well, I think their techniques are. I, Joe, I've read a lot of articles in the past, especially in the past, uh, what, whatever it is. Two years. Two years that mm -hmm. we've been doing this, and there are some that made it into even bigger journals that I was very surprised. Mm -hmm. Hopefully not ones we presented here, but you know, we read other articles as well while we're, where we're looking around for good articles. And mm -hmm. um, I don't think this was a, a terrible, uh, terribly written article. I think the, um, the graphics are great. I think they have an interesting idea. I just don't know. And it might have maybe a small benefit in, you know, depending on how you're looking at it, but it's just so complex. Mm -hmm. And I just think that the if you don't have to make something complex, why do it? Yes, I agree with you 100. percent That's that's just that's my only criticism. I think this article, yes, my, I think this article is a is a poster child of how not to deliver cardioplegia. Um, well, I mean, I guess if you understand it, how to, it, how you to know, complicate something that, that is so simple. Someone could probably say about our hyperkalemia cases as well. No, how can you say that? It's so much more <laughs> simple. This it's is so much, my, the hyperkalemia is so incredibly simple compared to, compare the hyperkalemia technique to doing, um, let's say, uh, uh, port access or hard well, port, whichever well, you want to call but it. My but point, well, well, let me finish. But my point let is to someone. You're not letting me finish. Okay. To comparing that to, our, to a standard cardioplegia and a hemoconcentrator for volume control to this. So tell me how, how, how you think the hyperkalemia would be more complex than than the difference between plain cardioplegia like we normally do and and this or some other technique port access even cross clamping i mean i think hyperkalemia is the simplest thing we've ever done it's so simple there's you don't need anything potassium hemoconcentrator some fluid and a neptune okay you you might be biased it's a great technique <laughs> thank you okay i need to make sure that thank you but that's all i'm waiting for but there are anytime you modify a circuit if you're not familiar let, think back to and i know you're not a fan of this but john you can you can be with me here think back to when the first times you were doing wraps right you're not even really modifying your circuit you're just using your clamps perhaps in a different way and even that um, there's potential for mistakes and anxiety of not doing something correctly that you're not used to doing. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's where the, the, my point about hyperkalemia, it's not that the procedure is so overly complex, but you're modifying your circuit, you're adding fluids, you're doing things you're not used to doing. Sure. That's the reason why the port access stuff, that those don't tend to work. I mean, sure, visibility and all these kinds of things, and, but on the perfect patient, it works great with the person who knows exactly how to do it. You could say that, too, about minimally invasive cardiac surgery. With a surgeon who really knows how to do it, those are easy cases. Mm -hmm. um, with surgeons that maybe don't have the skill level up yet or maybe never get it, they're very difficult cases. So mm -hmm. that, that's my point is if, if, you, can, if you have good outcomes um, with a simplified method that you're familiar with, I think that's the way you... I think that's what you do. I think so, and I think that that you know, I everything I do, and I think we all do this as perfusionists. This is sort of the, and I think medical practitioners do this um, as a as a as a whole group. There's risk and reward. Yes. And if it's you, you want there to be higher reward 
for the risk. Everything we do has risk. Mm -hmm. And not everything we do, however, has reward. And okay. some things, so you have to first look at the reward and then consider, is this a high enough reward for this level of risk? And then in my humble view, um, or perhaps not so humble view, what you just showed that circuit is way too high a risk for too low of a reward for me. What, that, what I mainly got out of it that I want to, you know, that's what I want for the, that's the whole reason why we, I like to discuss these articles is not necessarily even the article, but where is it going to lead me next? Mm -hmm. So now I'm very interested in giving different types of cardioplegia to the same patient in the same procedure. Yeah, I think that seems odd too. So that would be something really interesting because to find I've out often wondered that. about that. I've been in some cases where we use Del Nido, and the case maybe didn't go as the way you planned, and you have given multiple bags of Del Nido, and all of a sudden the pharmacy's like, "We don't have any more Del Nido," and we're telling them just mix it up, and they're yeah. and they're saying, "Can't you just use this Plegisol?" And I don't know if you can. So my answer was absolutely not. You got to make the Del Nido. Right. So I don't really know anything about that, but I'm going to look into that. Yeah, that's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that either, to be frank. Uh, John, do you? I, I think, uh, no, I don't know the answer to that, but I think what you're seeing here is it's probably not so uncommon with all the things that it, we, you are all, all three of us have experienced. I'll tell you what that is. You, you work every day, you use the same circuit, you use the same circuit, you're super familiar with it. You make a little modification to improve something, now you're super familiar with that. You make another little modification mm -hmm. six months later, you're super familiar with that. And a third modification six months later. Three years later, it's this very complicated thing. But to you, you've grown up with it. You've yeah. evolved with it. And it's really not complicated to you. But you walk in on the first day, you or you, 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 you or I, and we'd be like, what is this you know, nest you're, you're showing me here? But um, they would probably evolve with it. And I'll tell you, the reason mm -hmm. I think it's good that it's published is it gets people thinking about, well, you know, we do have a problem with a lot of hemo dilution with Del Nido. What is a way that maybe we can improve that? And I have a feeling the surgeons looked back at the perfusionist one day and said, you know, we like this Del Nido, but this hemo dilution, you guys got to figure something out back there where we don't have such a problem with that. And maybe there was another day when, when they didn't deliver it very cold, and the surgeon said to them, can't you guys deliver this a little bit colder? And they thought, okay, well, maybe if we do this, we can recirculate it. So I think this was a, a process. It probably took a, a couple of years or more, more to evolve to what to what you're seeing there. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, I but think you got to be right about that. Maybe, maybe some of us can adopt a little bit of this into our circuit without too much trouble. Mm -hmm. That's probably why it's a decent reason why it was published, is well, because it exposes stimulation of thought. Absolutely. And yeah. if they were using a real, a real cardioplegia delivery set, with a heat exchanger in it, like we all now use. And even if you use just an ice bucket, old Sarns bucket, but if you just use a 3T heater cooler, I'll throw a, throw a bone to Levanova in their 3T heater cooler, um, and you make it super cold versus using that crazy coil in an ice bucket, you could get it, I mean, a single pass is going, I've measured it before, it's really cold. Well, so you can do that. I, and that I, why are they using, why they have such complexity, but they're using something that is so arcane as a coil in an ice bucket for cooling their cardioplegia. That is interesting. I guess it's what they're comfortable with. That's what John was saying. They probably had something, you know, that stemmed from using a coil um, and that they built on that, you know, over, over time. I know the reason why this is going on. I have it figured out. What's that? In Singapore, no doubt they are using physicians to be perfusionists over there, and they just decided that they had to make this as complicated as they possibly could because they're bored. Um, something uh, because I just would never. I would even 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 over time, John. I could never come up with something that complicated for well, something that is so simple for us to do. It, it doesn't you know, make sense. It does stimulate some thought because with some sim simple modifications, we could also um, prime in a way uh, that, or not prime, cir uh, modify our circuit in a way 
that you are able to recirculate. Let's say that was something that you're interested in doing. Sure, you can recirculate cardioplegia. I mean, I don't think that would be complicated at all. Yeah. You just need a Y connector distal to your heat exchanger going back up to your bag. It's just mm -hmm. going to go around in a circle, and you just move the clamp, yeah. and you're delivering cardioplegia, or you're recirculating the cardioplegia. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a pretty straightforward, simple thing to do. But right, but I would have never even thought about doing that anymore. But they found a reason why. They think it, uh, you know, gives better uh, mixing. And I have noticed when you use Del Nido, if you're not really good about mixing your bag, which sometimes you're in a rush because you've got a surgeon who's, you know, you're on pump, you're filling your Del Nido bag, and they're ready to clamp, and they want you to give. And that's all going on within a couple minutes. Sure. And if you don't take the time to really try to mix that bag, by the time you get to the end, you, you do not have a, 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 a homogeneous mixture. Sure. You know, sure. you've got a lot of crystalloid, or if you misjudged how much you were supposed to put in there, and now you don't have quite enough, and you're adding some blood kind of midstream, again, you're not going to have exactly, you know, the, the right mixture. Mm -hmm. so well, I've got a solution to that. Don't use Del Nido? Don't use Del Nido on <laughs> adult cardiac surgery. It's not what it's meant for. That's number one. Number two is use a hemoconcentrator. Number three, they can want me to go on, go on, slow down, clamp on, back up, pulse plead on, up. pulse it up. They can, they can <laughs> want all they want. And I Pull have, the patient. And I have Scratch the my ability back. to oh. send, oh my God, that's so disgusting. <laughs> that's really vile. I mean, they're not going to ask me to do that. And I'm certainly, if they, anybody asked me to do that, there would be, I'd be the end of my job. But, I mean, you, we have the ability to say, I, I, I'm not ready. Mm -hmm. You got to give me a second. They can get as frustrated as they want, but, you know, I'm still mixing the Del Nido, and it needs to be homogeneous for me to give it properly. So, one second, please. You I can mean, see really? why Joe is not the favorite perfusionist. No. Well, but, uh, I mean, you Joe, do what you, you know. Sure, I'm not sure in a country such as Singapore uh, where um, – the respect is far greater from, uh, you know, higher ups to lower that you could probably take that stance. I'd be interested to know that. Yeah. You know, you know what well, I'm I mean, saying? I think Singapore's a pretty advanced society. I don't think that they are. Well, they're not. They're not. Um, I don't think that they're that. I mean, they may be in the medical community. I'm not really sure, but I mean, it's Singapore's a pretty westernized, advanced society. Isn't Singapore the one that? Uh, that uh, China's trying to take over now, aren't they sort of, uh, that's Hong Kong. That's Hong Kong, not Singapore. Yeah. But I think Singapore has the same problem, right? I don't know. I, don't well, know. I can't Singapore speak to that. Singapore is uh, largely Chinese people, and I can assure you that the respect from the hierarchy of age, and the hierarchy of education, and the hierarchy of, of female to male is very pronounced. Hmm. But I've known people from Singapore. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. But I know that. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah, very so, interesting. Uh, I think I'd love to see Joe pump a case in Singapore and have a video. <laughs> yeah, it would be, uh, it'd be, it would certainly be very interesting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I might do it in Singapore because I think I'll make it out of there, but it may be a bad idea for me to do it in North Korea. I might not yeah. make it, I might not make it back. Well, if I, I went do there appreciate the article being published because I think it's uh, stimulated a lot of debate, and those are always good articles. Absolutely. Okay, well. very good. Uh, any questions from the audience or anything? So I'm not uh, seeing anything come over the wire. That's Our viewership they, they is so good. Blow up the pictures to look at all those clamps. Exactly. You should have seen me with my. I, I don't want to say readers, but yeah, yeah, I was trying to see everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think it's very complex. I think the the bottom line is it brings out it does stimulate a lot of concern, a lot of thought. Mm -hmm. um, one is uh, you know of course I, I I don't believe in rap. I think ultrafiltration is just such an easy way to overcome any hemodilution that may occur. Um, I think we go on pump too soon, or too fast, I should say. I think in the old days, we used to just sort of mix very slowly, drain mm -hmm. a little and add a little, drain a little and add a little, and then we would have a lot less of that initial on bypass effect. And I learned this actually, and the reason I feel that way is I recently took a patient from our center to the medical center uh, to get them on the transplant uh, fast track, and they were an ECMO patient, and we had to switch over from our circuit to their circuit, 
and um, they were using a circuit that had a not insignificant amount of tubing length and size to it and a lot of hemodilution. And when they switched it over, the actual switch out was only 41 seconds. And this patient was, you know, they were ECMO dependent, but not so much so that they couldn't tolerate a minute or two of being off. They had enough, enough residual lung mm -hmm. that they weren't going to just crump right there. But so the initial change only took 41 seconds from the clamping, cutting, reconnecting. It was when they turned it back on, there was this much longer period of time of just this crystalloid going into the patient, and he seized. I mean, he seized. He was getting ready to code. His uh, heart rate went, went up. I mean, he really had a problem with that. And the last several ECMOs that I've done, unless the patient was crashing, I have gone on very, very slowly and slowly ramped up my flow until, uh, not until full flow, until I actually saw blood coming mm -hmm. out of the oxygenator and it was oxygenated. And I think going on bypass, we would benefit patients in that regard as well because mm -hmm. it can take a minute or two, you know, to get blood into the patient, even with our low, uh, low priming volumes. So not I think if you that wrap, would be a benefit. If you wrap, you got blood right away. <laughs> okay, that's true. That's true. <laughs> but I think hemoconcentration is just such a simple way to avoid excessive hemodilution. And mm -hmm. just, again, it's risk-reward. And I think that any time you're not on pump and you're moving clamps and draining one way or whatever, there's always an increased risk, and I think that just hemoconcentration is a very simple way to do it. It just makes more sense to me. Mm -hmm. So that's 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 my perspective on it. I don't think you I don't think you reduce transfusion need by wrapping if you ultrafiltrate. You have a hemoconcentrator in line during the procedure, and the incremental increase in cost of a hemoconcentrator is so small in comparison to everything else that's mm -hmm. happening there that I think that the benefit is 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 100% towards hemoconcentration on a routine basis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. Some surgeons are opposed to it, though. And they are, you know, everyone has an opportunity to be wrong, even even heart surgeons. And this idea that hemoconcentration, so we're using an open reservoir. Think about this for a minute. You have an open reservoir. You're on bypass. The heart is totally flaccid. You have it full of blood. And let's say your level is 15, 1600, and uh, your hematocrit is 17. And they would rather you give a couple of units of PAC cells with all of its risks and, and, and complications associated with it than to hemoconcentrate off your reservoir volume, which doesn't change any of the patient's volume status. And they think that that increases renal uh, complications postoperatively. I don't know how you can even connect those dots, but I have seen people try to do it, and it's, it's a, such an absurd argument. I can't even have an argument with somebody about it because it makes no sense. Well, I don't necessarily hear that when I hear opposition. I hear that um, perfusionists um, take off too much volume and then therefore post-op they're dry and so they're going to uh, be hemodynamically unstable shortly thereafter and then the surgeon is being called and what, you know, we're gonna give, you know, are we gonna, can we give them the fluid, can we do this? And I think that, that that's been the more common thread of when I've had opposition mm -hmm. from surgeons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I usually can combat that with, I, since we give Del Nido, right? or whatever, prime, I'm only going to take off what I put into it unless sure. this is just an overloaded patient. Right, right. You know, I'm taking off the Del Nido, and if I have enough to also take off, you know, my, my uh, you know, leader prime or whatever it is, mm -hmm. then I'll do that as well. Mm -hmm. And you, you know. Well, in the critical care unit, everybody understands, I think, it's, it's commonly understood that drier patients do better. 
I don't think you want them to be tissue desiccated by any stretch, yeah. uh, but normalizing the COP, removing the fluid that you need to remove from the intravascular space to have a full heart, appropriately full, not overloaded, or a bunch of pump volume left over that you're going to throw to the cell saver and get rid of all of the plasma and platelets and only conserve the red blood cells, um, you know, probably doesn't help. But I think that if you were to exaggeratingly raise the COP in order to drain out, to, to reclaim intravascularly all of the extravascular fluid you could, that, yeah, you're going to have third spacing occur, you know, redistribution post, of yeah. that volume mm -hmm. postoperatively. But I've always argued it is much easier to give volume than it is to get volume out once you leave the operating room and you're in the critical care unit. Mm -hmm. So, I, but I think that, yeah, you can ultrafiltrate too much, um, but you can, uh, but, but you, you have to work at that. If you're just hemoconcentrating enough to make yourself normalize COP and you have normal fluid distribution in your fluid compartments within your, within your body, and enough volume come off pump with with a euvolemic heart that's functioning properly, I don't know why you would, I mean, if you have to give volume, you have to give some volume in the mm -hmm. ICU. It makes sense. Mm -hmm. Higher hematocrits do better, um, especially if you can accomplish that without the need for allogeneic transfusion. And minimizing uh, bank blood is really a good thing. Um, having sure. high enough uh, blood clotting uh, factors in your and not so diluted will help with your coagulation postoperatively mm -hmm. and reduce your your uh, bleeding uh, complications. So to me, I don't see any downside to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. John, if you keep yourself with a prime in your albumin in your prime, mannitol in your prime, and keep yourself minimally hemodiluted, this doesn't happen because the volume that the ICU is talking about, why the patient doesn't have intravascular volume is because you stayed hemodiluted during your case, didn't hemoconcentrate, and all the volume you thought you were going to benefit from, third space. Yeah. Right. And right. that's why they're saying, you guys, you know, you can't hemoconcentrate because you're getting rid of all the volume. The more hemodilute you stay, the, the volume goes third spacing, and then they're intravascularly dry in the unit having to chase volume. Mm -hmm. But I know for a fact, because when I first started this uh, field, we, we would hemoconcentrate and keep our COPs high during the case, and our patients were three to five pounds overweight, not 15 pounds like they were before we started doing this, and the patients didn't have any problem with volume because it takes just a little bit to increase their intravascular volume because it's not all fluid shifting into the, into the tissues. Yeah. And mm -hmm. tissues and lungs and kidneys and liver and, and uh, GI tract can absorb many, many, many liters of fluid, and uh, you wonder where all that volume goes. Well, humans you know, are made up of how much fluid. Humans are made up of 42 liters, the average, you know, 70 kilo man, is 42 liters mm -hmm. of water, you mm -hmm. know, of which only, not even, not even five liters of that is, or let's say six liters, is intravascular because you have to take out the cells. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. your actual fluid volume intravascularly is your whatever your, if your hematocrit's 50%, it's 50% of that because that's solid. That's what, those are cells. So three liters, we'll say, or two and a half liters, or three, three to three and a half liters, three to four liters of intravascular volume and 42 liters total body. That's an awful lot of fluid. Your body can hold, I mean, I've seen people, the high, worst I've ever seen, I think, was a patient who was 30, three zero liters fluid overloaded. 30. I have seen 30, three, wow. zero, 30 liters, and oh, yeah. she survived, and we survived her. Can you believe that? 30 liters. Well, how many times have you been in the unit and you've seen them taking off 1,500 to 2,000 uh, net loss per shift, and they do that around the clock for days and days at a time? Sure. Oh, yeah. What did our patient have the other day? Five? Five liters? Yeah, five liters of yeah. urine. Five liters of urine, uh, one of our ECMO patients. And still intravascularly full. Like no right. flow problem. No flow problem. No five problem. Five liters of urine came uh, Yes, out. absolutely. You guys, were, you guys had finally gotten where you were pulling all this fluid across, and it's amazing how much 
your tissues, when you encounter all your peripheral and your and your internal tissues, can absorb. It's mm -hmm. amazing. Well, you many, have many liters. And I tell people this all the time. You have to respect your plasma refill rate, your you know your your PRR. You have to do it because if you don't, you're not. You, if you don't adjust your COP, your collagenocytic mm -hmm. pressure yeah. intravascularly and you're just hemoconcentrating the intravascular space and not getting the fluid, the, your plasma refill rate to come to, to reclaim that fluid back from the uh, interstitium, you will collapse them cardiac-wise. Likewise, when you are in the ICU and you're, and you're on VV ECMO, for example, versus VA ECMO, VA ECMO, you can still have that problem, but VV ECMO, and you rapidly correct an anastarchic patient and correct their COP to get volume over, if you don't have a way to get that volume out, you're going to put them into heart failure and they're going to die right there in front of you. Mm -hmm. So you have to really consider the plasma refill rate and you have to take into consideration your COP. If you have a patient with an albumin of 1.2, don't give them a whole bunch of albumin and expect them not to go into heart failure. You have to be prepared to manage that fluid. And that's why when you see these fluid shifts in the ICU postoperatively, people aren't taking that factor into mm -hmm. consideration. And I think they need to better understand that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything else? No, I think we can roll the, uh, roll the intro. Okay, and welcome to John Ingram's Knowledge Nuggets. John, floor right. is yours. All right, guys, thank you. So we are episode number 12 of John Ingram Knowledge Nuggets, September 1st today, and uh, I'm your host. And as you know, with this episode and all previous and in the future, I don't expect to have any disclosures on this topic. So our motto, why do we call this program Knowledge Nuggets? Well, we hope that you can just spend a little bit of time and expand your mind. So this week's topic is going to be ammonia blood levels. What does that mean? So the format, if you guys have never seen before, we hope hopefully take a noteworthy topic each session. Uh, we hope to give you a powerful, impactful little a segment where you can take home a little bit of knowledge with you. And if you see that gold nugget in the screen, that's kind of a take-home slide. You can screenshot that, and you can use it tomorrow, hopefully, when you go into, into work. And we hopefully that you'll become a better clinician where you have another added piece of knowledge to your, to your repertoire. So it's hopefully just going to be about a 12 or so minute highly impactful segment. Then after that, we follow it with a surprise, something we call Perfusion Gem of the Week, just a couple minutes of something really unique. You never know what that's going to be. And after that, we follow it with panel discussion and questions. And if you guys either are watching this live or in the future or in an older, older session, please email me at john.ingram at perfweb.us, and I will always answer your questions. And I'm ho very open to comments and suggestions for future program topics. Oh, OK, so ammonia blood levels, what does that mean? So here you go. Right off the bat, we have a, a, a golden nugget slide. So we want to define ammonia and just kind of a review here about what we hopefully learned in school and in our training. But also, you know, if you see somebody with a, a ammonia level that's not normal, sh should you be concerned about that and what does that mean? So ammonia is a waste product and it's primarily perform primarily formed by um, bacteria in the, in the intestines during the digestion of protein. So if it's not processed and cleared from the body appropriately, excess ammonia can accumulate in the blood. Ammonia is normally transported in the blood to the liver, where it is then converted into two substances, one called urea and the other one known as glutamine. So the urea is then carried to the kidneys, where generally it's eliminated in the urine. So if this urea cycle or this urea process 
does not complete the breakdown of the ammonia. Ammonia then builds up in the blood, and then the problem is it can pass from the blood into the brain. And we're going to talk about some of the effects of why that is and what happens when that happens. So just to give you some reference, the normal range of ammonia in your blood is usually somewhere between 11 to 32 micromoles per liter. Ammonia is highly toxic. It's a waste product. Now, normal ammonia concentration is generally below 50 micromoles per liter, if you want to just kind of remember a rule of thumb. But when it increases to 100 micromoles per liter, it can lead then to disturbances of consciousness. I'm going to talk about some of those. Blood ammonia concentrations, though, of 200 micromoles per liter, that is then associated with coma and convulsions. So generally, when we talk about ammonia blood levels, we can get concerned when the ammonia blood levels are elevated. But there's also such a thing as a low blood ammonia level. But we're going to talk about today an elevated blood ammonia level. So what is an elevated blood ammonia level? Well, ammonia, as I said, is a nitrogen waste compound that is normally excreted in the urine. An elevated blood ammonia level, of course, is an excessive accumulation of ammonia in the blood. An elevated blood ammonia level occurs when the kidneys or the liver are not working properly. And that's kind of a good thing to keep in mind. Why is someone's ammonia level high? That's going to tell you that the kidneys and the liver are not functioning, one or, one or both, they're not functioning properly to eliminate this waste appropriately. And so therefore, if they're not working properly, there's going to be a higher level of ammonia waste in the blood. So ammonia, like many other waste products, can be toxic and is toxic to cells at an elevated blood level, that, and it can also affect many parts of your entire body. Elevated blood ammonia can affect a person at any age, and it can happen for a variety of reasons. It's actually fairly common in infants in whom the disease can be related to some sort of genetic condition. That's one, that's one aspect of it. But in children, commonly it's related to Rye syndrome. You guys have heard of Rye syndrome. Basically, we're going to talk about that in a minute. But it's a dysfunction of your liver. And as we said, liver not filtering out the ammonia very well. In adults, however, it's going to indicate uh, kidney or liver damage or some underlying metabolic disease where you're not metabolizing, usually in the, in the liver, properly. It can also be due to drug or alcohol abuse. Again, those are probably going to detrimentally affect your liver function and or kidney function. So what are some of the common symptoms of an elevated ammonia level? This is kind of a little bit of a take-home slide because if you do a lot of walking through your ICU or, by the way, ECMO, and you see somebody that has some of these symptoms, a lot of times they may have an elevated ammonia level. People are confused. They have fatigue. You can have loss of appetite. You can have nausea. And you can also have pain in your back and your sides and in your abdomen. You can also have muscle weakness. Now, symptoms that might indicate a serious condition are when you start having absent or markedly decreased urine production. You also are going to see decreased levels of consciousness. And you're even going to see things like passing out or unresponsiveness changes in mood, personality, or behavior. You know, the person is a, uh, not, not themselves. Their, 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 uh, their personality is not normally like this. And they have these strange mood changes and strange behaviors. The family will usually pick up on this, or the bedside nurse, pretty, pretty acutely. Sudden confusion for no reason also. And this is all indications of the high ammonia level going across that blood-brain barrier and affecting your, your neurostatus. In infants and children, a congenital disorder, disorder of ammonia metabolism, uh, usually something that's disrupting the, uh, the urea cycle that we talked about. You could have a hemolytic disease, a disease of blood type incompatibility between the mother and the fetus. Any, any type of lid, liver or kidney damage, like we mentioned. And then Rye syndrome, as I said before. And this is a condition usually triggered by some sort of viral infection. But it causes increased ammonia levels, usually because of the dysfunction in the liver. But it results in brain 
and liver swelling and dysfunction. So Rye syndrome is a very big concern in the pediatric realm and not fully understood, I don't believe. Now, the causes in adults can be alcohol or drug abuse, which we're going to see with some frequently, frequency, medications such as diuretics and narcotics, excessive exertion. Excessive exertion can cause it where you're producing so much waste products, and if you have any you know, decreased function of liver or kidney, you may not be removing that ammonia rapidly enough. GI bleeding can cause it, and also heart failure, which basically has to do with decreased liver and kidney perfusion. Therefore, they're not functioning as well. So some other causes in adults can be hepatic encephalopathy, damage to the brain, but this is subsequent to the liver failure causing the high ammonia level. Kidney disease, again, poor kidney function, kidney stones, kidney failure, any type of liver disease or damage such as cirrhosis, hepatitis, or again, poor blood perfusion to the kidneys, heart failure, severe dehydration, and intestinal bacteria overgrowth. Remember what I said earlier, that ammonia is uh, produced by a bacterial breakdown of the protein in your intestine. So if there's some uh, malfunction there, this could cause a high ammonia level. Urinary, urinary tract infection organisms, and the, and the primary uh, culprits here are your Pseudomonas, Klebsiella, Morganella, and Coronia bacterium. Smoking can also be a contributor to a high ammonia level because, by the way, there's a lot of ammonia in cigarettes. So what would we treat it with? Well, remember I said it's a product of protein breakdown. So somebody who's having a high ammonia level, we would limit their protein in intake. We can give them medications to reduce the ammonia levels, lactulose, antibiotics, certain antibiotics do this. Medications which break down the ammonia, rifaximin, larathonine, and let us aspartate ha happen to be some. There's others that help our bodies break down the ammonia. You could treat the urea cycle deficiencies. Arginine, sodium phenylbutyrate, and sodium benzoate are all three things that help uh, treat our, uh, help accelerate the urea cycle process. Dialysis may be in order, but this would only be if it's uh, like above 1,000 micromoles per liter. Would you go into renal or hepatic dialysis to really try to clean out and decrease those ammonia levels? And in very, very severe cases, you might require a kidney or liver transplant. It would be very severe cases for those two. So why do we care about this? What are some of the complications? Well, if left untreated, it could bring a pretty rapid onset of dementia, encephalopathy, which would certainly be uh, something that would be evolving. Uh, it could result in organ failure of the liver or kidney. Then you would have edema. And of course, you could put the person in unconsciousness and even into a coma. So you don't want to leave high ammonia levels circulating for very long. All right, so we're looking now at the gem of the week. And uh, if anybody who's watched before or doesn't watch before, the gem of the week can be absolutely anything I decide to come up with. Could be a trivia question, could be on tips on how to succeed in a virtual interview, perhaps. It could be a, a wonderful job offer that's out there that we might want to discuss. We've done that in the past. It could be something in the perfusion news that comes out. Could be a product recall. I might find something interesting that goes on with an interesting product. Something that occurs in cel uh, celebrating perfusion week. We could also take a famous quote, such as this one by Einstein, that we took a, a quote by Einstein one week. We could also talk about a great upcoming uh, conference, such as Joe's conference, the New Orleans conference. We could talk about an upcoming meeting. So this you got to change that to 2022, John. 2022, there you yeah, go. You yeah, you got to change that to 2022 because uh, New Orleans is now, of course, uh, I don't think they're going to be back for a while. They got really hammered with Ida. Oh, did yeah. it really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that hurricane? 20, yeah. I don't think it's going to be 2022. Either. It might be 2023. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> so this week's Gem of the Week is going to be tips for a successful virtual job interview. And I know at our institution, the guys there, and girls there on Perfusion team are doing quite a bit of virtual interviewing this day. So how would you fine tune and make sure that you did a good virtual interview? Now, people always know how to go out and, and Google search the top 10 things to do to prepare for an interview. 
So some of those are true, but I'm trying to concentrate on when you're doing a virtual interview. So number one thing you want to do, check your internet connectivity and confirm your camera and microphone are working. But ensure you have a fast internet connection. If, if you generally don't have a very fast inter connection, internet connection at your house, maybe you want to upgrade it or go somewhere where there's a very high speed internet connection at your neighbor's house or something because you don't want a jittery, jumpy sound or video when you're trying to you know, uh, interview with somebody. You want it to go very smooth. You could, should consider a webcam. The cameras on your computers sometimes are good, but a webcam are almost always better. Sometimes they come in with a built a built-in microphone that's going to be a little clearer than your little laptop. And a lot of people even recommend that you do a headphone because then the sound quality, they say, mm -hmm. is quite a bit better. You need to close down all the programs, all the other programs running on your computer other than the video conference that you're having. Your computer will run faster and smoother, most likely. But getting your equipment to work at the last minute is very stressful, and you should not procrastinate and doing those things above there that I've listed. Do those a day or so or a week or so ahead of time so the last minute it's all ready to go. That's all about number one. What about number two? You need to think about the camera and the lighting. When you put a camera up on your, uh, let's say it's a mounted camera, generally people don't know how far away to put that camera. They put it too close. They put it too far away. The general rule is about two to three feet away from yourself. But you need to position the webcam just above eye level. A lot of people make a mistake. They mount the camera too low, and what the interviewer sees is that they're looking up at the person. They're looking up through your neck and through your chin. Mm -hmm. When you point it uh, above eye level, just about a couple inches above eye level, this actually gives the interviewer the proper perspective where they're looking at you as they would if they were sitting in, in front of you. And you may have to use a laptop stand or put your laptop on some type of uh, books or something to get that webcam slightly above your eye level. You should, this is a mistake people make also. You should have the light source in front of you. Place yourself facing a window if you can find one to take advantage of natural light. Because if you have backlight, if you have light behind you, it casts a shadow on your face. And that's what you don't want. If you don't have a window, use a lamp, but use a lamp with a very low glare bulb in it, OK? And then always do a dry run and test things out ahead of time. Call a friend of yours, do the live video uh, test with a friend of yours, and see how things are looking so that when you go to do it, you'll know how everything's going to appear to the interviewer. What about number three? Set the scene. Now, you want to set yourself up in a room with no distractions. You don't want any noises coming through. You want your background to be very plain and pleasant so that the interviewer is not distracted by what's going on behind you. Joe, do you remember this uh, thing we were watching one time? It wasn't on, on PerfWeb, but it was another uh, thing we were watching. And the person had an ocean scene, an active ocean scene going on behind them. Yes. Waves and birds flying. It was a fake scene. Yes. It was some type of video or something. Yes. Highly distracting. Do you remember that, Joe? Yes, very well. Well, and I'll, I'll add to that in the COVID world where we're doing all these things from home and people don't necessarily have a studio set up, right? Just like for this interview. I'm sure you guys remember this making the its way around when we were first starting to see news broadcasters at home. And there was a news broadcaster who, you know, did the best he could with his office at home. Um, and he was giving the local news and just in the, the, the background was his cat who you couldn't stop looking at the cat because the cat was giving itself a bath. So you, you looked at the newscaster, but then you just keep looking at the cat. You know, have no idea what he said. It was mm -hmm. just too distracting and funny. So ocean cat, you know. Well, not only that, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but I'll also point out that when you do these fake backgrounds, um, like we were, uh, I was watching a different, uh, a different channel um, doing our opposition research, as, you, as we like to call it. Um, and uh, <laughs> you laugh, I know. <laughs> and uh, we do a lot of that to see what other people are doing because, you know, there are some, some things that are actually really good and we want to adopt those good things. Absolutely. But when you c try and cut yourself out, and this person was online with one of those fake backgrounds, 
and every time they would move, they were they were trying to be really cool and wearing this cowboy hat, and then the cowboy hat would kind of half disappear because the 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 software wasn't working terribly well, and so keep it simple, yes. make it a pleasant background. It doesn't have to be anything extravagant. It doesn't have to be a fake background. You you know you're in an interview, and what you want people to focus on. I to so much agree with you, John is you, right. nothing else. You could be just have a blank wall behind you if you want. It would be right. better than yes. having uh, having uh, something else. But you could put a little table with maybe a little flowers or something like that behind you. But avoid the fake backgrounds. They don't work well. They really don't. Yeah, the, the I think that's called green screening or something. Oh, okay. Is that what it's called? Yes, Where, green screening. And, and the problem is that most people can't, really afford to buy the very, very, very expensive one like they use on the weather channels and stuff where the person is using green screen, but you never know it because it's so sophisticated yeah. that, it, that it cuts the person out instantly. Well, any cheaper version, it's delayed, and so you look like you're getting you know, silhouetted and cut off as you move just a slight amount, and I'm sure that's very distracting to the person you're interviewing with, and you don't know it's happening because you're looking at them and you're not looking and seeing what's happening with yourself. Exactly. Very, very, very good point. Right. Keep it simple. Yep. Test it with your friend, somebody, whoever. Yep. Do some, some, and then go back and watch yourself. Because yeah. what, you know, go video it, you know, so people can, so you can see how you look and present. Mm -hmm. As an employer, I want to know about you. I don't, I, it's important to know John, you bring up such good points. It's so important for us to recognize when somebody has taken the time to be prepared and everything works and you can get through the, the interview process and have a conversation with them and you feel like, it, like they took the time to make sure their end was operational. Well, and more specifically, because we've been doing a lot of WebEx, Microsoft Team meetings yes. recently. Yes. And if you have a scheduled time, you know, you've checked all this out in the beginning, so good for you. But now it's meeting time. Don't wait to start logging on and doing all those things a few moments or even minutes before your meeting, because sometimes something's crashing or something this, or you need to get situated. And so it's okay to go ahead and be in the waiting room, waiting. Be early. You know, you would arrive to a normal interview, you know, 15 minutes early, early right? Or more. Or whatever, but you know, mm -hmm. you're in plenty of time. If you're 15 minutes early, you're already late. Okay. Um, <laughs> same thing with, uh, you know, it's just showing that you took the time to um, not waste someone else's time. Yes, absolutely. As an, as an employer, um, that is something that I take that, that you get a lot of credit when you're prepared and on time. Yeah, and one more thing. I mean, this is off topic a little bit, but I think we're saying learn something about the people, whether it's an interview or meeting, that you're going to be talking to. Absolutely. I just recently yeah. had a meeting of 10 people, and I don't knew one of them, but I took the time to look up who are these people so when they're speaking to me, I can understand their perspective and what they might be after. And same thing with the job interview. Learn about the position or the company, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the people that are in it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad I, uh, I, when I finally got around to picking this topic, I was hoping exactly what you guys are doing because you guys have interviewed and interview a lot of people and you're probably doing a fair amount of virtual and I was mm -hmm. really intrigued in seeing what your comments are because there's so many things that can distract away from what you're trying to do, which is to have a good interview. And so this next one here, you know, it sounds obvious, but make sure you've turned off everything yes. you can think of. The TV and cell phone are obvious, but also close some nearby windows and eliminate outside noise. There's people that live in parts of the country where they, it's, you know, nice temperature outside. You can leave the windows open. Next thing you know, you hear a lawnmower going by or some kids running by, or who knows what, or dog barking, and all of these things are going to take away from how well you thought about 
how your interview is going to go. And this also inclu includes all your messaging services yes. and your social medias because like you're on the computer and all of a sudden these things are popping up on your computer making little bubble sounds and alerts that you're getting a message and your interviewer could probably hear some of these things. You know, yeah. And they're distracting to you as well. So we're going to see some more of these things here. Now here's the one I like a lot. You can adjust the screen of your, of your, of your program. So a lot of these video calls allow you to see yourself and the interviewer on the screen. Oh. You can experiment with the placement of these windows so that they're displayed for the best arrangement. So in other words, put the interviewer's window right underneath your camera so that when you're looking at the camera, it appears to the interviewer like you're looking at the person. Smart so idea. The interviewer screen at the bottom and you're doing this every time you talk to the person, but the camera is up here, you're going to look like, you know, less than appealing. Mm -hmm. So I kind of like that one a lot. Yeah. So, so now, wow. of course, this it goes back to interview. Be prepared, but prepare yourself for all interview questions that you can possibly prepare for. And one thing you can do in a virtual interview that you may not get away with so easily in person is you can have your resume in front of you, but and, ref and refer to it as a reference. If the person asks you a question, you can actually refer to it if you needed to. Also, what Tammy just said, prepare some common questions for your employer because you've researched your employer. You should know if you're interviewing with, you know, HET there, that they have X number of accounts and approximately X number of employees, as opposed to interviewing for a hospital staff position. You know, it's so much more refreshing when the person's interviewing, you're interviewing, says, oh, uh, you know, uh, I understand that you guys cover four or five hospitals in the Houston area, as opposed to saying they have no idea what you cover and how does it work. You know what I mean? These things are easy to find out. We have a small field. You can make some phone calls, send some texts. Somebody somewhere is aware of sort of how, you know, you guys operate there in Houston and give them some general idea. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so here's the one I like, and it, it, it applies for all interviewing. As I said, some of these would. But don't memorize your answers word for word. Memorize what you're going to say, but you want your answers to flow naturally as if you're speaking. And what you said earlier, Joe, is practice them out loud, record yourself, and play it back. You will learn an enormous amount about how you sound to the other person. When you play it back, you'll be like, oh, geez, I didn't know I sounded like that. I need to fix this. Whereas you thought it was fine at the time. When you play it back, you'll find out maybe it wasn't. And also, keep your answers concise and impactful. Nobody wants somebody to ramble on on a simple question for five minutes, right? They want to have an you know, impactful, concise conversation and be sure and stop speaking when you've completed your thought. That, yeah. that pregnant pause shows that you've completed your thought and the interviewer will then interject something else and you're not tempted to keep rambling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Monitor your body language. You're not going to be able to shake hands on a virtual interview. Sit up straight, try to smile a lot, keep the camera at eye level and try to make con constant contact, eye contact with the interviewer. You have to try to make a connection here, but you're not in the room with the person face to face to be able to make that connection. So you have to go a little bit extra here to try to come across as a, uh, a valuable person that they would want to hire. Now, dress for success. You know, dress as if you were interviewing in person. Just because you happen to be at home and everybody's doing everything from home now, that to me, that doesn't necessarily, you can dress however you want. And another, there are studies that have been done, many studies have been done that when you dress appropriately for any situation, it naturally instills more confidence in you as a person. Have you ever been somewhere, Joe and Tammy, where for whatever reason, not necessarily an interview, but you showed up somewhere and you were very underdressed for the situation? Or overdressed, because that happens to ladies sometimes, and that's embarrassing too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's distracting. You know, you try to overcome it and put it out of your mind, but you never can quite get it out of your mind because you feel self-conscious. You could also overdress. Have you ever been someplace where
where it was casual Friday and you didn't get the memo or something like that. And you could feel very, it, it, it hurts your confidence to be dressed uh, inappropriately. But, but if you dress appropriately, especially in an interview, it's going to make you feel more professional. You're going to come across more professional. And you're probably going to be able to speak with more confidence. That studies have shown it does have an impact on your psyche. <clears throat> and what about, what I said earlier, making a connection? You're not going to be present in the same room. It's more difficult to make that personal connection with the people. So make sure you speak clearly and make sure you, you speak, I wouldn't say loudly, but definitely speak with a good volume because you're relying on a microphone to transmit your voice over to them. Share an outside interest. This goes back to interviewing in general. You want to show that you're a well-rounded person. Again, you're having a little more hurdles to go through with making co a connection with people. And I remember, Joe, a year or so ago, we did a talk about interviewing, and you were very big on the outside interests mm -hmm. that the people have. You wanted people to work for you who really had outside interests other than work. Is that correct? Absolutely, 100%. He still says that in every interview. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I interview people, it's very low on my priority. I want them to do good at work. I don't care what they do at home. But that's the exception to the rule. A lot of people want a well-rounded person. That shows most of the time that they're going to get along well with your other coworkers, is right. what that also indicates, because they're going to have interests. They're going to make friends, most likely. They may even become good friends and go out and do similar things with those people, and they're going to work better together at work. Mm -hmm. You're more likely to have a long-term employee and not be you know, revolving doors so much. Right. And I think I have a couple more. So, but, you know, be yourself like in, inter, inter, uh, like in any interview. Um, your, your interviewer, um, you know, it's more difficult that for them to catch on to your enthusiasm because you're coming through a screen. So make sure you're expressive with your words and when you're answering your questions, but always be yourself and come across genuine. And number 11, the final one, within 24 hours or so, should always send a thank you email to everybody was that was in the interview with you. Sometimes it's a you know a team interview. Uh, thank them of course for their time and for the opportunity to interview. A lot of people don't use that word. Thank you for the opportunity, and that's really valuable I think because these people took their time to interview you, and they really didn't have to. They could have looked at your resume and tossed it out. Never gave you the opportunity, and you could sometimes just put a sentence or two in there reiterating your unique strengths of why you'd be a valuable employee, but make sure you keep it concise. This is not the time to rehash the interview and to rewrite the script and try to fill in all the gaps that were left out. Just a little quick nugget, but keep it concise if you feel like you need to do that. And I think that that's the end of that one. So as I said before, you guys can email me at home. If you're watching, john.ingram at perfweb.us. Any comments, questions, I'll always reply, and I'd love to hear suggestions for a future upcoming show. Very good. Excellent. Very, like very, very line. good. I like it. I, I enjoyed it a lot. A very <coughs> excellent, excellent work. Um, so I think what we should do, because we did get a really good question, a couple from Jacqueline Lamb. Uh -huh. um, Jacqueline, I don't know your email address, so if you could email me your home address at Perfusion, uh, or no, at uh, info at contact, contact at, at perfusioneducation.com. Perfusion yes. If you, can you throw that up, uh, 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 David? Yeah, there it is. Um, Jacqueline, if you'll do that, we're going to spin the Tammy Sparacino Journal Club Casino Wheel, and you could win one of several different prizes uh, because we appreciate our, our uh, viewers our colleagues who are watching, and especially really appreciate when people have a good, thoughtful question that we're able to answer. answer. So Jacqueline, thank you very much. Okay, so, so I think, get it back. yeah, I think we need to go to the wheel. Where um, is the wheel? I don't know, I'm looking for it. There it is. There it is. There's my wheel. Okay. Um, Tammy Sparrows, you know, yep, okay. All right. There it is, okay. So. We have several prizes on here. This is for Jacqueline. Jacqueline, you are going to have to send me your, your address so that we can uh, send this there. Uh, Magic just put it on the YouTube so you can uh, see that email. Okay. All right, here we go. Let's spin away. Oh, wait, before you do, before you do, that's okay. Let's let it go. We'll, we'll, we'll let it go. John, can you, I'm going to let you talk about 
where these things come from. But let's hope they don't get an aortic dissection. <laughs> no, they're going to get a cup. cup. Oh, great. Well, the cup is going to... John, tell, talk about the other items that we have, and uh, I'll go grab one. But you are going to get... I'll, I'll send a pair so that you can share your favorite hot beverage with somebody that you love um, and uh, and uh, uh, do the and get a PerfWeb cup. Uh, these are great. These are really well, these are sought after collector items. So you want to make sure you hold on to it. And then we have a, a question, Mariel B. Dear John, Joe, and Tammy, how often do you check blood ammonia levels? In my clinic, we only check them on indication oh. in liver failure patients and in case of not understanding reduced consciousness. I mean, I think that makes a lot of sense yeah, to me. Yeah. I would not routinely check ammonia levels. I haven't. Yay, sending my address to your email, Jacqueline. And then Mariel B., you also asked a really good question. So we're going to go to another one, all right? So, uh, Mariel, you'll have to get, make sure I have your address. We're going to do two spins today. All right. right. All right, here we go. And then, John, I need you to tell about uh, these other items. So let me go grab one. Yeah, Hold go on. Yeah, grab one and John's we'll talking about items, Joe, so we can show Yeah, uh, so the cups it. come from us. These are PerfWeb cups. Those are really the best, the best gift on there, except for the extra call. That's good, too. But All right, so we're spinning this for, what's his name, Mar Mario? Uh, no, Mario B. Mario B. Yeah, so we talk have, a little bit about some of our cool we perfusion stuff. We have T-shirts in a variety of different different colors. Oh, sorry. Could you go to a different camera, maybe over here or something, so I don't have to get in Tammy's face? I think camera three. Camera three would probably be camera the best. Three, right? Camera two. Camera two. Oh, two. Go I to mean, two, yeah. Two. So there, there's camera two. So we have these T-shirts. We have ball caps. There, there you, you go. go. Yes. Um, we have, we have. Look at this. We have scrub caps with, and it says perfusion. We give your heart a rest. We have scrub caps, and so there's a lot of options of things you can win. So we'll go ahead and uh, and John tell about where they come from. So my good friend and an ex perfusionist extraordinaire of of 20 years plus experience by the name of Alan Klima came up with the design idea. He made, makes them himself, and he donated a whole boatload of these things to the show. Has he not, Joe? Joe? Yes, and, uh, a ton. Uh, yeah, a ton of stuff. And uh, he, he's setting up a website where he can go on there and you can order these things. He goes around to occasionally a perfusion shows and sets up a little booth. And he's really just doing it for fun. He came up with this really cute logo, a cute saying, you know, perfusionist, you give your heart a rest. And uh, people love him. So uh, it's been a great addition to the wheel, I think. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So and to make sure we answer Mariel's question, um, we, we, I, do, I don't routinely check ammonia levels for any reason unless, there's a, un unless there was a reason to. Correct. Um, uh, same for me. John? Yeah, it wouldn't be something you do on bypass. It's more of something to have your base clinical knowledge, so you can have some more clinical knowledge other than, you know, just going on pump and pumping cases. When you walk through the ICU or you're on an ECMO case or you're doing something somewhere, you know, you'll be knowledgeable about, about something a little bit outside the box. And that's why I wanted to cover this, not something we talk about every day, but you want to be able to be knowledgeable about some of these peripheral sure. things. And, uh, and it makes you a much more well-rounded clinician, you know. Well, Absolutely. patients, people with, you know, people, patients, people with uh, chronic liver disease, could be from alcohol abuse, you know, and cirrhotic liver disease. Um, you'll notice that they will be taking lactulose um, in order to control their ammonia levels, mm. uh, and uh, of course, that's so. That's not an uncommon problem. And I guess if you had a patient who was on long-term BV ECMO, and you started noticing their their liver enzymes bumping, and the patient, let's just say, is in a wake. ECMO and, uh, you know, waiting for transplant and you started noticing a uh, behavioral change of some sort mm -hmm. or consciousness level, they started act acting intoxicated, um, you might want to run an ammonia level at that point in time. That's well, what I would seen, think. We've seen that a number of times. Yeah, that's what I would think would happen. Okay, mm -hmm. so this is ready? for Mario B. Right. Yeah, all right, here we go. Hopefully it's not extra call. Here we go. Or, or worse, they were in a dissection. Here it goes. Here it goes. 
Oh, what's Barry going to win? Oh, Barry, oh, come on, come on, come on. Oh, Barry will be wins extra call. That's just not right. Uh, we'll, give, we'll give him one more chance, one more chance. We can't do that to you, Mario. Can't do it. But she said, thank you. Thank you. are welcome for the extra call. No, we're not going to let it go like that. No, you're going to give her an aortic dissection. What's no, wrong with you? Do you just not like her? No, you get an aortic call and you get an aortic dissection. Can we spin one more time? Oh, my gosh. You can spin one more okay. time. This is it. Whatever this it is, it. is. This is legit. Okay, we're not, we're not doing this on purpose. <laughs> Gonna go fast, go fast, go come fast. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah, okay. You get a ball cap. So, Mario, if you'll send me your address and uh, the color you would like, there's there's a variety of them. There's green, I think there's blue, there's uh, the green is a white solid and blue. canvas, the blue yeah. has the white mesh back, and then I think there's a solid black as well. Oh, my God. And Barriel said, I would love to visit with you one time to do an aortic dissection together. <laughs> no, no, I don't want to do that. No, I have no interest. You're on your own. Um, I'm done with that aortic dissections. Look, yeah. look at all these options. Yeah, there so you we go. Have a, okay, we have a camouflage black, and it's, it's, it's all fabric fitted. And then we've got adjustable blue. And then we've got, uh, this one's soft. This one's more of a stiff design. Uh, and it is all army green. And then we also have a blue one that's blue bill with the white mesh in the back. Absolutely. So just let us know which one you would like, color you would like, and we will get these out to the mail. And, of course, Jacqueline, you're going to get two beautiful perp web a cups, a pair, and I'm probably going to throw a scrub cap in there with it. So yeah. thank you all very much. This has been a great show. Lots of fun. And uh, enjoy your extra call and the dissection that's coming at 2 o'clock in the morning because that's when it always is. I and, wanted uh, to make sure and thank uh, uh, Vanderbilt Medical Center yes. and Matt and Katie for yes. joining us this morning. Katie's excellent talk about single ventricle repairs. Single ventricle physiology. Physiology. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, John, as always, great knowledge nuggets. Absolutely. So this has been a great show, guys. Thank you all very, very much. And we will see you on Thursday, September 23rd for PerfWeb 68. And I am going to give be giving a lecture on the factors that influence DO2 during cardiopulmonary bypass, why do you need a perfusionist? So, uh, you know, the thought being, of course, we have autonomous vehicles, we have autonomous mm -hmm. planes, we have, you know, do we really want a pilotless plane transporting us around um, the decision, the human dis factor and human decision making um, that gets made in reference to all of the information as it's being perceived versus just how it's being seen by a computer is so vastly different. So the question is going to be, you know, why do you have to program a computer? So why do you need a perfusionist? Because really, ultimately, what are we there for? To perfuse the brain, give it oxygen, preserve all the rest of the organs, protect the heart uh, for a brief period of time but at the end of the day, the operation still needs to get done. So how do we, how do we use human judgment, experience, in order to make the decisions that we make? Why do you need a perfusionist at all? Thank you all very much. We'll see you on September 23rd. Thanks, everyone. Best show ever. <laughs> Thank you.